Tonight's show and topic of discussion do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Spaced Out Radio, SOR Media, or its hosts. Listener discretion is advised. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we are about to take you higher. Broadcasting from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado to you listening around the world. Welcome to Spaced Out Saturdays on Spaced Out Radio. You can follow Tessa on our Facebook page at Spaced Out Radio. On Twitter, at Tessa TNT. And you can subscribe to her YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio for our archives. Now, broadcasting from our Mile High Radio Clubhouse on Spaced Out Saturdays with your host, Tessa Nicole Thomas. Good evening, Spaced Out Radio. Secure your tinfoil hats, buckle down tight, and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at mile marker 419.9 in colorful Colorado. It is Saturday, February 9th, Sunday, February 10th, for those of you on the East Coast and beyond, and this is Spaced Out Radio. I hope you guys had a rockin' week and an awesome day and an even better evening. I am your host, Tessa TNT, and I am live tonight broadcasting from beautiful Bayfield, Colorado. We are 150,000 strong nightly on Spaced Out Radio Network, spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, Paranormal Radio, TalkStream Live, 10, oh, sorry, 99.1 FM WQEE, Noon in Georgia, home of The Walking Dead, 107.7 UPRN in Louisiana, Revolution Radio, as well as Deep Talk Radio, which you can find at deeptalkradio.com. You guys, don't forget to head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, where you can peruse the Spaced Out Radio store and read the encounter online dealing with everything strange, paranormal, and odd. Tonight, I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight, we are talking to and getting to know Mr. James Moses, who is a independent researcher as well as a theoretical physicist. Let me scroll up here. And this is the quote I have for him. How exactly is it we're here? Might we even be other places too? Possessed of insatiable intellectual curiosity since he was five, He's an independent researcher and theoretical physicist. Jim Moses continues to refine an evolving, more unified and expedient model vision for all forms of existence in an information-based multiverse that could best answer that question and empower us vastly and simplify our lives. Hey, James, thank you so much for being here. I'm so honored. Hey, Tessa, thanks for having me back. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it was so great. Um, when I first met you, you came on with Corrine De Winter, which is our guest tomorrow night. And I was just, like I was telling you earlier, like my mind just exploded. I was like, holy shnikes, what's going on here? And just all the information that you had and it all just kind of made sense. It was so awesome to hear what you had to say. And I just had to hear more. Can you tell us more about what you're doing right now in your life? Definitely. We've got a lot of changes coming. I think that a lot of your listeners sense that, but they're not necessarily sure what kind of form they're going to take. And the more we're aware of who we are, our relationship to any number of different parts of our lives, we're going to be in a much better position to determine what exactly those changes will be and how they're going to affect us. So that's a lot of the reason why I'm here to kind of make the relationship we have with ourselves and this thing called, well, what I call and a lot of other people are starting to call the multiverse, more personal because it is personal because it's the basis for our true equality more than anything else. So can you tell us a little bit about um, when this all started for you and how you made this way down this path? 
Well, I was very young when I started reading. Uh, I had a mother who just, there were books everywhere, books and magazines. She had actually been a teenage librarian in Springfield, Massachusetts, which, of course, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Richard Hoagland was uh, one of the heads at the Museum of Science in Springfield. I was in the astronomy club for a time, but the ability to really indulge my interest in the natural sciences started very early on. I had a lot of the golden books. I don't know if I'm too old in comparison to some of your listeners, but um, they were small books you could get. Uh, some of the toy stores had them. A lot of the bookstores around here had them, and they were all color, some of them painted, some photos, and there were various topics, various um, divisions of the natural sciences. Astronomy, certainly. I think the book was called uh, Planets and Stars. Another one focused on geology. Another one focused on plants, flowers, so forth and so on. And I had an interest. I went through different phases, started off with the dinosaurs, like most kids, I think, uh, made a lot of lists to kind of try to, you know, be able to wrap my head more around these things and went through these phases. I had a chemistry set at seven, um, fairly sophisticated one. Thankfully, it didn't blow anything up and um, a telescope, an empire refracting telescope uh, long gone by now. But I can remember very vividly back in 71 the level of excitement at being able to uh, see both Saturn and the, R the Ring Nebula was huge. I mean, it, that again, it really makes it personal when you see them for yourselves. You can see photos, but it isn't quite the same impact in that instance. From then on, I got very interested in a lot of alternative physics, uh, metaphysical, paranormal, whatever name you want to use. And as I will talk a little bit more about it, I think there is very much a basis in science that, that unifies all of it. But uh, Bermuda Triangle was a big source of fascination. Uh, the Oak Island Money Pit, which now it's incredibly gratifying to see the Lagina brothers beginning to really get to the bottom of all this. And I think the history is definitely going to be written, rewritten by some of their discoveries, uh, North American history especially. All these different topics, anything that was of a mysterious nature, possibly in part because my mother was always into mysteries. Yeah, I really this love I love their show and I love I've been watching it every year step by step. And sometimes it's like, OK, are we going to find something? And, you know, they found that awesome cross and they're finding these different outlines of uh, rooms and such. And they're finding so much. It just takes a little patience. And like I asked Kat earlier, I was like, how long does that take, you know, to have patience? But um, I love that show and I love what they're doing and that they're actually spending money to find the answer to this because there's been so many lives lost and so many people trying to find the answer to this. What exactly is there? What are they trying to hide? And I can't wait to see what they find. Well, based on the last episode, and I had a feeling we were going in that direction, I won't take too long because I want to get on with, with, you know, other things. But it seems like there's definitely a deep Roman foundation, which obviously is going to rewrite American history like nothing before it. And it's long overdue because we, you know, we, we, we celebrate Columbus Day. And I'm just going to put this out here. I have a very strong desire to turn, change the name of Columbus Day to Discovery Day, which really speaks to what we're talking about with people uh, that, that are, you know, so self-directed in their interest of, of learning about any number of different things. The more that we can stimulate that intellectual curiosity in the kids coming forward, the more prepared they're going to be to take an active role in how exactly our society is reshaped. And that's, that's incredibly important to me. It's so very important, and I always hope that things that I am interested in and things that I'm reading or things that I'm watching on TV, my kids will take an interest in, too, because, um, like I read earlier, it's not just what you do in this world, but it's what you bring into this world as far as your children, and I'm hoping that they'll see these things and kind of carry on with it. Um, I'm hoping the Luganus brothers find something and are able to put these spirits at rest, the spirits that were lost searching for the answers to this. And not only that, but people that have been reading this in Reader's Digest or whatnot for all these years, you know, giving them answers and, you know, is it the Holy Grail or is it just a whole buttload of gold and silver or what exactly is there? And it, they have buried it and done so many different like booby traps and such to keep it from being found. It makes you think it's really, really something very important. And I've heard that 
or seen that it could be, you know, um, the Holy Grail, basically, or it could be something less admirable. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, the, the indication to me is that there's definitely a Templar involvement. Uh, people that I've, I've befriended on Facebook who are, have an active role with the show uh, as guests certainly are pursuing that line of reasoning. Uh, a couple of different ones, Gre- uh, ones. Gretchen Cornwall, who has a book uh, that I can't remember the exact title of, but Sangreal is in it, which means uh, sanct- sa- sainted blood, basically or Saint Real being royalty. It's a lot of mixtures in terms of word meanings. And then also Petter Amundsen, who did decipher a distinct pattern of code, which would indicate Sir Francis Bacon's involvement in in, uh, Templar-related projects, including Oak Island, as well as Shakespeare kind of being, for lack of a better term, a beard. Uh, Really, really amazing to see this process unfold for me, because I've always suspected it, and now... There seems to be some substantiating occur, uh, substantiation occurring, but I'm not 100% sure of that. The other thing I was going to mention is that, that I have maternal roots in, Oak, in uh, Nova Scotia, Cape Breton. I've never been up there yet, and I hope at some point I will be able to. This certainly will be an impetus for me to get go to get to see a lot of this stuff because I've seen so much of it on TV already. Yeah, and it's so amazing, all the different things that come out. Um, Ancient aliens, I'm so interested in. And, you know, you can take it here or there, absorb what they're saying, or just kind of deflect it. Um, And then the Curse of Oak Island, like, I've just been kind of obsessed with it. Like, what are they going to find, and what are they going to do? And and there's more and more money going into it because people are so interested. And it all started with someone seeing a light in the woods. What is this light? And they kind of seen this little lantern light, which is kind of out of date for where they were. And they're like, what is that? Where is it? And, um, there was even a slave that was released and he ended up buying basically most of the Island and who knows what he found and what he passed on to his family. Like it's very interesting and intriguing. I must say. There is definitely the thought that all the McGinnis brothers did end up finding treasure, but it was kept very quiet. And there was there have been artifacts that the uh, descendants ended up revealing on Oak Island. As, as for Samuel Ball, you are right. He was one of the earliest freed slaves, freedmen, as the term goes. Uh, he allied with the British because the Americans at that time were not looking to focus on liberation of slaves. Uh, it was too early in, in the, uh, the country's existence to do so. Not, no judgment attached. It was just the reality, the economic reality, unfortunately. And uh, he definitely bought up a lot of land, a fair number of plots on Oak Island, and appears to have uncovered something which made him comparatively wealthy for his time. Uh, there, there's evidence that, that there was a lot more found than is actually known of. I think that the show has unveiled some of it, but not all of it. And I think the more as they go on, the, dig, the, the deeper they dig, literally, They will find layers that indicate, you know, different types of settlements. Um, It's it's interesting because there's a lot of aspects with respect to the role of the Templars in history. The Freemasons, the Rosicrucians especially, the Rosicrucians started out as a secret society to try to end up providing a safe haven before the Renaissance really was able to vanquish some of the more... um, brutal practices, uh, Spanish Inquisition and so forth, but it was supposed to be a safe space for people to have intellectual discourse. It's turned into something a little different since, and there are other aspects that I could point to, but I'm not going to get into that in this particular show, which are a lot more familiar probably to your listeners. It, it's, But it does tie in somewhat in terms of the understanding which is emerging. Uh, another gentleman I would encourage people to at least explore a South African by the name of Wayne Herschel has gone probably the furthest since both Eric Von Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin in terms of being able to assign symbology to all these different things. He all over the world. I mean, it, it's a trip to go down the path that he has and begin to understand how much he's pulled together. I'm, that's a fairly new development for me, but he points to things that make so much sense in the scheme of things with respect to our origins in outer space far back, you know, how far back it's hard to say, but if we're to believe the Catholic Church having, you know, extrapolated from uh, Judaism as well as the Egyptian 
practices, a lot of the art that shows up in Egypt, all points towards two constellations in particular, and I'm getting way off topic here, but not so much perhaps in some ways, mm -hmm. Orion and Taurus. That there is a relationship and a star which corresponds to the quote-unquote star of Bethlehem. Ostensibly, that's what Wayne is asserting, and his logic makes, it makes a lot of sense. It really does, and you know, going back to the slave that bought all this land, they're excavating and finding, you know, the one of the buckles on the um, chest and finding a chain link. And then when they found that cross and then they went back um, to the land of the Templars and such, they found that cross on the wall. And they're like, hey, this looks exactly like the cross we found. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, they're on to something, you know. <laughs> and I was like, you're, you're meant to find things for a certain reason. And it all just kind of goes in a circle. It's basically a circle. Things are meant to happen for a certain reason. And it all starts with the universe and goes through us and throughout. It's, it's pretty it, interesting. It's that old syn synchronicity. And I'll, I'll just I'm going to qualify a little bit. Having some background, I actually went to college for television. It's not real-time editing, but there's definitely enough. Uh, there's, there's not a big gap between when they found the cross and when they went to Dunn in France and had seen that exact cross. So you're right. I mean, it's, it is, it's very, a very wondrous thing to be seeing because it's so much a, an, an alternative history that we've never had. The linkage has not been there between the religions that we're familiar with in the United States and in North America and the religions that prevailed over in Europe, which some of which there was a lot of folding over between Catholicism, you know, the Ottoman Empire, Constantine. But and, you know, we could talk about that for a good long while. There's no doubt. I think that probably a lot of your listeners are very interested in these in these things as well. But what I want to uh, if, I, if I may segue a bit. Yes. And I'm, I'm going to opt for a bit of a, a cliche in the process. Unfortunately, I think it's unavoidable. At this present moment in our evolution, the most immediate analogy is, you know, of a computer. And with that in mind, I just wanted to say in terms of having an understanding, we're reaching for the understanding. That to me is really a big part of, 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 of what will allow us to be able to have the greatest impact on how our lives unfold going forward. Rather than, quote unquote, education, it's a personal understanding and a relationship that becomes critical because without that meaning, it's hard to engage people a lot of the time. And the one thing that we really can't know, I think that most people will acknowledge, is who was, who or what was responsible for what I refer to as the original input. Whatever resonant information was introduced into this completely, this, this void, which had absolutely nothing in it, even the vacuum as it exists now in space, is loaded with information of various types. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Nassim Haramein, in, uh, in, in a long-form video, I, I highly recommend if people haven't seen it yet, called uh, Black Hole with a W, has, has developed a mathematical equation which demonstrates just the immense amount of information which is contained within each cubic centimeter of space. That was not once the case because you had a situation where for whatever reason and as i say it is extraordinarily difficult for us as humans with our particular brain capacity or whatever you want to call it to imagine exactly what chain of events brought us to this point and even going back that far but what i can say is there are analogies to be found in in, in the way that health operates you know how life comes to be in the first place which it's almost and, a, you know, a microcosmic expression of the process, you hear the words Big Bang and there's this immediate vision of an explosion and it's not quite so dramatic. A lot of this evokes not necessarily intentionally this notion of Shiva, the great destruction, the god of destruction, creative destruction. And while it's understandable that people would have that view for a variety of different reasons, I think it was a little bit more of a benign process and probably cyclical, but again, we can't go back far enough to understand how that cycle, again, began. The word began by itself ends up putting us at a disadvantage because the minute we use the word began, there has to be something 
there couldn't have been nothing beforehand and why would there be nothing and you're, that's when your head really starts to explode if you go too far down that path but well yeah and they think there's nothing but there's dark energy and um Oh, what's the other one? I was watching all kinds of space things this last weekend, and there's so many things out there, and out of 200 million or whatever stars, only 2,000 blink in a certain way, and they're thinking this could be aliens trying to um, communicate with us, or it could be somebody has built... Oh, man, I put my notes away. Um, Somebody has built this thing around the stars that collects energy, and it could, like house energy w- for civilizations for so long and, and that would be just, a dyson sphere yeah dyson sphere and it it just really blew my mind and all these things that they know dark energy and um dark matter and all these different things that when you look out there you see a lot of darkness you do see the lights some of them twinkle some of them don't but this dark energy is making our universe expand exponentially. Like it's expanding so quickly and faster and faster and faster. What does it really mean? Like, is it going to expand to the point that it stops and kind of collapses? Or is it just going to keep going and going? I'm hoping and thinking it's going to keep going. Um, but yeah, there's so many amazing things out there that we can't even realize. And all these people are studying it and building different satellites and different things um, to observe it and collect information. And it just, I don't know, it really makes my heart throb. Like I love looking at the stars every night and I'm like, Hey, that one's twinkling at me as a kid. I used to think it was my mom waving at me or whatever, but it could be an alien race trying to communicate with us with these different, um, phases of light. Or it could be like you said, the sphere. Ah, but maybe we can't answer them. I'm going to do my best tonight to put out some potential answers because I think that it really starts with, and, and I may end up coming off as a, her- a heretic here. I'll be, for, I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest about that because a lot of things that we have taken for as givens are going to be challenged in the course of this of this show because I think that the more we're able to recognize that it's a very subjective relationship we have with all these things. There really isn't much of a difference between energy and matter. It's all information. It's just a matter of, uh, quote unquote, it's, I I hate because again, semantics can drive you up a wall. It's a matter of what state or form it takes. And that's the media, whatever the media would be in that instance. And the media is whatever already exists. The denser parts of it are systems. They can be planets. They can be any number of different bodies, whether it be, you know, on a planet or out in space. I mean, the differences are not very, they're, they're, they're very subtle in the scheme of things, although I don't think that science teaches it well. And because of that, things like dark matter, dark energy, the only reason that they're dark is because we don't have the means to perceive them. We may be able to re- perceive them other, by, other than by sight, but the, the thing I'm saying is, is that it's always been there. It's information. It's information that has the potential of altering whatever environment or media it's part of, depending upon what other information might be introduced into that particular area. You know, if you're thinking of fields being, you know, just intricately entangled throughout the multiverse, and I'm going to bring up a uh, an analogy that I think that I, I offered in, in the appearance with Kareen that will really, really clarify it in a lot of ways and bring us to the next place I want to go. Uh, other places, as you had said in in the lead-in, is that this level of entanglement, the relationships that are formed, uh, information being communicated from one part to another, this whole notion of quantum, which actually is relativistic at that scale, it's more about the effects, not about the process. The process occurs at, at both scales and in between, everywhere in between. But the analogy that I want to offer up, and if anybody listened the first time, they'll be able to appreciate what I'm getting at, is take a handful, or a very big handful, we'll say, of stones, of rocks, mm-hmm. and you're looking at a fairly well, a fairly dense body of water or any fluid. 
you throw those in and you're going to change the structure of the water. You're going to have all sorts of reconfigurations in terms of the magnetic fields that are produced by it. You're going to have swells. You're going to have lulls. You're going to have all sorts of things happening. But you're also going to have structures produced as a result that will have information related to whatever force you applied in order to throw those stones in. And also the particular nature of those stones or whatever objects are changing the structure of that, of that media, of the water. Now, if you're able to maintain that information, which allows for the structures to have even formed in the first place, that becomes existence. And it just it would continue based upon whatever source is continuing to provide the information. In our case, it's actually the sun. Uh, it was discovered or confirmed by a professor who I think I may have mentioned last time as well, uh, Gerald Pollack, who has written a book called The Fourth Phase of Water referring to the more plastic state between its liquid form and ice, he basically discovered that infrared, is, infrared light is what allows for structures to be maintained organically, naturally, that that is the primary means of growth. The metabolic processes would seem to take the role of uh, providing you know, overall uh, mobility, in other words, being able to do work. Avoiding to using the word energy, it's about being able to perform tasks, do work, functions, whatever the case may be. That, to me, it may end up being the distinction. I'm pretty sure that this is what it adds up to. And the instance of infrared light providing structure and allowing for what's referred to as morphological expansion, growth, it's, 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 it's pretty much, it can be called, honestly called photosynthesis, just without the chlorophyll to be able to... Uh, um, support the nutrients which would allow for the process to continue and as with plants but mm -hmm. we any object would need to have some sort of photosynthetic means of reconciling light because without it depending upon the nature of its structure it would fall apart just the right resonance and i'm going to demonstrate that this has already been proven by a, a visionary back in the 20th century very important one whose work's being rediscovered his name is royal raymond rife but he demonstrated, as is the case, that Tesla, to a certain extent, too, with his earthquake machine, just the right resonance, the composite resonance, which addresses every part of a structure, will end up breaking it down, causing it to disintegrate. And it, it's, it's pretty amazing when you see how cut and dried it can be, depending upon environmental conditions sometimes. So these are things that are very much prevalent. The, the, the absolute constant in our existence throughout the multiverse that is formed as a result of just such an action. As I say, the, these, these areas, the structures that are being formed, and they can be, depending upon the number of objects that are pr producing the effect in the millions and billions and trillions, depending on how much these objects are able to sustain that structure, you're, you're going to have what would be referred to as a multiverse. And because the information is familiar, related, you have then what becomes a family of lives, that our past lives, our future lives are happening simultaneously. Time really does not exist. It's a very subjective thing that's based upon resonant values, how much we're entangled with whatever density is the media if the media resonates much more fully, we're going to feel it more fully if we're more extensively entangled. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And I think this is just an absolute rule of existence beyond any other. The more that we begin to understand this, the more that we stop. We've externalized a lot of these concepts where time is this lofty connection to light, the rate of light uh, path through space, which is directly related to media. It all comes down to media and uh, that's going to be demonstrated again in a bit. Well, isn't the, that again um, entangled in the string theory? And it's out there and um, whatever information we put out there goes along with string and it's out there and it's kind of folding against each other and going this way and that way and all throughout the universe. Even radio waves are being put out there and you can hear it bounce back um, when the... What was it? Oh, man, I can't remember the name of it. Um, the big air balloon was 
taken down in fire and flames and all these people died on there. Um, Speaking you could, of Hindenburg. You could, yeah, the Hindenburg. You could hear that. Oh, coming glad you back one. Years later. And then when the aliens were coming in and taking over the earth, that bounced back as well. Any radio waves we put out there eventually come back years later. It's generally like eight to ten years later. You can hear it on a broadcast and you're like, wow. Anything we really put out there is bounced back and forth. And if there is life out there, they can hear it. And I know they do. And I know we're not the only ones here as far as beings. There's other beings out there. And I've heard um, by doing research or whatnot, there's at least a hundred or more different species of human beings. To us, they're alien beings, but they're really very interesting Humanoids, I think, is a pretty good word, and a lot of people use that. But you 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 segued into a topic that I hadn't actually even uh, included in my notes. But mm -hmm. that basically ends up being an analogy to, uh, you know, any number of different paranormal experiences. The thought form, the tulpa, it doesn't go away. Every time we're we're we're, we're transmitting information, whether in the state of physical or ethereal. There's information constantly being exchanged or communicated because we're, we remain entangled even after physical death when the body, when the structure, which is, has, has, has a far higher index of resonant potential, it's resonating so much that inevitably at some point relative to how much the media is changing, there's going to be a breakdown that occurs. Whereas with the less dense, it's less vulnerable because it's not going to be resonating nearly as much. The information is still going to be transferred. Those fields don't go away. We're still entangled. We're still alive, as it were. You know, we're still conscious is a good word because consciousness is kind of synonymous with entanglement. It really is that cut and dried. It's what allows for us to have a, a, a collective consciousness, even though we may not be necessarily aware of a lot that, of the information we're receiving because out of necessity, when we're in the physical state, that's where the greatest focus has to be maintained in order for the structure to be maintained. I apologize. My son um, is scared because he said the pillow just flew off the bed. Oh, he looks oh, so my. sad right now. It's okay, I Floyd. I hope I didn't have anything to do with that. But. No, he couldn't hear you. He's like, Mom, Mom, while you're talking... Um, yeah, he's got his little pouty face on and he's all scared looking, but he's okay. I just told him, my mom and dad are here. They're protecting you. There's nothing going to get you. <laughs> he's got his bottom lip poking out like I used to as a kid. My dad would say, you keep poking your bottom lip out and a train's going to come by and run it over. <laughs> That's a new one on me. That's, I have to admit. At, yeah, I had not heard. I can see how that would be kind of a discouragement. Okay, I'm gonna, definitely not going to stick my bottom lip out then. I don't yeah. want it wrong. I used to do that. I didn't realize it, but yeah, he'd say, you keep doing that. The train's going to come by and run it over. And I'm like, what? So I'd suck it back in. <laughs> but my son was just doing it. That was cute. And I apologize, you guys. My son was left here alone with me this evening because my husband's uh, truck, the clutch went out so he can only take two kids with him. So I have one here left with me. So, um, but he's a good boy. He was just kind of scared for a moment because our house is very, very haunted and we have different things coming in and out because we are all very gifted. And, and so it's pretty interesting and intriguing, but sometimes he gets overwhelmed. Com completely understandable. I have a lot of tales that I can share along those lines. There was a poltergeist in our house back in 1975, but I'm not going to get into the details now. Um, oh, I so love to hear it. I'm so into that stuff, but yes. Um, uh, if you have more important pressing things, we still have an hour and about 26 minutes left, or two hours and 26 minutes left for the show. Yep. Um, if you can fill us in on that, like I'd love to hear it. Well, I will tell you that there's a there's a there's a train of thought that uh, a line of reasoning that there is a there's a connection that occurs. Um, a Scottish jouser by the name of David Cohen has done a lot of research uh, around his part of uh, the Highlands in Scotland and has discovered a lot of paranormal events. Again, I think this is becoming a common thread are are driven by magnetic field transfers entanglement and. I, there is a thought that when kids are going through very traumatic times, 
there's a projection that occurs because they have no control. There's there's a level of need to uh, for catharsis. You know what I'm saying? In other words, to really process things. And there's not a lot of control over that. You know what I'm saying? It's not a given that it's in every case this is, you know, what happens. I do think the magnetic aspect is a big part of it, though. Not to say that there aren't spirits, but I I think that a lot of things that are perceived as spirits, it's because of the way that they interact with us. And Cohen, without necessarily being aware of it, does kind of provide a fair amount of evidence to that effect. But what I was starting to say is, is that at one point, we were we had gone to bed. I know that the lights were off in the house. I'm 100 percent sure of that. Certainly the record player was off. And I got up in the middle of the morning, probably about, I'm guessing, three, three thirty. The living room light was on and the record player was on. There wasn't music playing, but it was it was on. And the re- one way that we knew was my mother's uh, portable record player had a velvet um, turntable. And uh, there was a very distinctive smell that was made when it was turned on. And I smelled it. And I'm like, what is going on here? It was scary, you know, because it was the level of mystery involved. And there have been other things. Oh, there have been so, so many other things that I could share. Uh, Some pretty wild stuff. But that's that in terms of poltergeist, that's the most immediate with respect to my I was probably 75. I would have been uh, somewhere between either 11. More than likely, I think I would have been 11 years old. Yeah, I've had um, all kinds of paranormal experiences through my life. Starting as a toddler, we used to play at the foot of the sky in a rocking chair wearing coveralls at an old family house. And so I'm assuming he was family. Um, We thought he was real, but to the adults, he wasn't there. And then um, when we decided to move out of this house... He threw a really major fit, and yeah. cabinets started opening and closing, like slamming, and dishes were flying out, and the house was shaking, and he was very upset that we decided to leave. Um, but that was my first paranormal experience, and then um, when my mother, a week before she passed, I saw a woman, actually I first heard her coming down the hallway, I could hear her shoes clip-clopping down the hallway, and... Um, I was calling out for my mom. I'm like, mom, like maybe I didn't see her go past the door, mom. And I keep hearing it getting closer and closer. And then the last time I called out mom, like she was there in the doorway and she stopped and she was wearing this, um, like 1800s lace dress and she had a veil and she had these boots. And I saw these boots in the antique store, uh, two weeks ago. I was like, wow, those are the boots that she was wearing. And she was about a foot off the floor, probably six inches to a foot off the floor and there's a little black cat going around her feet. And she stopped in my doorway, slowly turned and looked at me, and slowly turned and looked back down the hallway and kept walking. And then I heard my mom's door creep open, and then I heard her go in and close it. Um, so for the longest time, I thought she was the one that took my mom. But then later on, getting back in contact with our family, my oldest sister and my two older brothers went with their dad when my mom passed and me and my little brother went with our dad. Um, we finally had a reunion and everybody's telling all their creepy kooky stories. And my sister had an experience with this lady as well. And she's listening to her Michael Jackson thriller record. And she turns around and she sees this woman in in her room and the lady tells her close and lock your window. And she's like, you know, an argumentative teenager. Who are you? What are you doing here? Et cetera, et cetera close and lock your window and she continues to argue with her and then finally the third time she's like close and lock your window like a very stern not angry but stern and serious voice Mm -hmm. um so she turns around and she closes and locks the window we lived off a bend of a highway there in Salem springs and um she went and told my mother that night and my mom's like just do what she said we'll go and check in the morning and see what what had happened and so she locked and closed it and slept through the night the next morning we went out there there was rain and such and there were footprints outside the window and marks on the window as if somebody was trying to get in um so this lady was not really the person that took my mother's life but she was a protector of our family yeah um and so it was very interesting and intriguing to me to realize she wasn't the one that took my mom she was the one that was trying to protect us 
kind of like a guardian angel. And there are people that step up even in life. They're doing it without necessarily being aware that, you know, there's a, there's a predestiny involved. As I say, it's these, there's a lot of times where the linkage isn't apparent until sometimes later in life, sometimes out of the material existence. You know, you there's more communication that occurs with the other side than people even can even begin to imagine. I'm pretty much the survivor of my family. There's nobody left. My all my pretty much my entire family, aside from my half sister, is gone. She's out in the uh, southwest. But mm-hmm. um, what I was going to say is, is uh, I've communicated to an extent with my with my family, with my father, my mother, my brother. Um, I've I've gotten information. Someone that uh, Kareem knows well by the name of Renee Richards has been a very good resource with respect to providing a conduit to them. I have uh, communicated through someone who was involved with uh, Travel Channel Ghost Adventures in Connecticut. Uh, He was able to connect me uh, very briefly uh, in terms of electronic voice phenomenon. And we saw the effects when you have the dimming going on with the change in temperature they're utilizing that in order to transmute it for 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 communication as best as possible you know without organic organs boy that sounds redundant but you know without a larynx (laughs) and so forth they're not going to be able to sound exactly like they did but the resonances are very similar and i knew it's almost like a preset uh it's the analogy i'm preset on a car stereo very similar to the situation where children, particularly twins, and their mother especially, but also father too, they just know when things are happening because of these presets. Well, in this instance, the preset immediately ends up recognizing a particular resonance, even if it isn't exact. It's enough close. To, it's close enough to it to know you feel it. You, there, there is no illusion when you hear. And I am semi clair uh, clair audience as well as clairvoyant, but clairaudient had about three or four occasions. There is Mm -hmm. no talking yourself out of it. You know they've communicated with you. You you, you can't fool yourself is what it comes down to. And the problem is there's a lot of people, no matter how much you try to communicate that, they won't believe you. It's a very personal experience, but when you have it, you just know you've had it. Yeah, I had somebody um, interview me several months ago and they're like how do you know you weren't dreaming because i know like i was awake i've always had this sleep issue where i've had really vivid nightmares i've had different things appear to me i've always had issues sleeping the rest of my family would fall asleep before me and i'd be sitting there tick 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 all night long trying to go to sleep and then this lady appears and i know i wasn't sleeping i was sitting there watching the reflection of the bear clock bouncing off this wall into the next wall and watching the river flow and it's amazing the technology they had back then to do that like to me it's amazing but it could be quite simple um but i would just stare at it and try to go to sleep and I was so afraid, and my dad told me, say, God stands before me, Satan fall behind, and I actually used that a couple times in my life, even at one point when I know I saw the devil, and when my aunt and uncle took us in, my aunt actually adopted me this last year in May, Dad, the cat, and um, the cat she she's always been my mother since my mother was gone. She took us in, she raised us, and I don't know where I'd be without her, you know? And every time I think of her adopting me and her taking that on, I, I just, like, cry happy tears. But it was awesome for her to take us in. But when I try to share the story with friends of mine, I was ridiculed and judged. When I try to share the story with my sister cousin, she's my cousin, but now she's my sister, um, she'd run off and tell her mom. And then mom would come in and yell at me and be like, that was not real. That was just your imagination. And even today... The paranormal really, really freaks her out. She does not like to hear about it. She doesn't. She doesn't want to hear anything about it. She won't even let me sage her house because, you know, she's a Christian being and she doesn't believe in those things. Even though these things have been around for centuries and centuries and centuries, sage and Palo Santo and all these other things have been around for cleansing rituals, which doesn't make you a bad Christian. It's just a form of protecting yourself because it really takes an extreme issue for, you know, Catholic priesthood or anybody else to come out and sanctify your house. 
Well, I, all I will all I will say is is that I, I'm I'm very leery because I think it again the externalization of this stuff becomes it, it becomes a disempowering thing in the end frequently, and there will be more than enough people that will manipulate you as a result of that belief. I do think that there is an effect that occurs, and I think that it's no coincidence that when people are preparing to die or they're being received, as the term goes, it's very subjective again. It's, you know, if you're brought up a Catholic, if you're brought up a Protestant, an Episcopalian, a, you know, if you're Jewish, there is a very specific set of events uh, that occur at the time when somebody is preparing to pass on physically from this life. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it has to do, again, entanglement becomes a very, very powerful thing. And I, I can only say that the nature of a lot of what I feel we experience as being demonic has more to do with the, the, the um, how do I put this? It sounds like a slur to say imagination, and it's not exactly imagination. It's an archetype that takes on kind of a life of its own because there's so much karmic belief invested in it. And that's the weird thing for us as humans is that we it's tough for us to imagine, almost like a, a do you, are you familiar with the term golem? It's similar to a tulpa, but more of a, of, of, of a life form, kind mm -hmm. of a life form in Jewish mythology. Yeah. You've invested so much energy. You've created uh, almost a, um, I don't know how to put it into words, I see things, knowing as I do the origins, uh, let me ask you this, and, and, and some of your listeners, are you familiar with the origins of the devil? Yeah, he yeah. was basically... I think that led to her demise and I was muted just then. Um, but yeah, to reiterate, I was in the same bedroom with my, that my mother slept in. I woke up from this horrible dream and at the end of my bed, I'm trying not to fall in this hole of fire, which you guys have probably heard this before. Um, I woke up from this dream thinking of how real it was and I still smelled smoke. It wasn't the smoke of fire and brimstone that I was smelling before. It was a sweet smoke. Not the same smoke as the velvet tobacco my grandparents smoked. It was a cigar smoke. And this guy put the cigar up to his mouth. And as he did, I could see his face and what he was wearing. And he was wearing this tuxedo with a bow tie, etc., etc. My mother, when she saw him, she saw his full form. Because he did come right up to her bed, right next to her bed. At least when I saw him, he was just in my doorway. And I used the line that my father told me. God stands before me, Satan fall, fall behind, and just like that, I was knocked out. I didn't have to deal with it anymore, but my mother had a far and lengthy conversation with him, and um, that could have been what led to her demise as an adult. She knew exactly when she was going to die. She had a casket before she died. She had her father help her plan her funeral months before her death, knowing how exactly she was going to die and when. Two things I want to offer up. No, number one... Um the origins of a lot of Christian traditions and theology are two places. One with the Sumerians, the Mesopotamians, uh, and the other, the Egyptians. And in the case of Satan, there is a direct link to the, uh, the equivalent of the Cain and Abel story, Osiris and Seth. And Seth basically was viewed by the Egyptians for quite some time as a very dark figure as a result of his role and ostensibly, again, I use that word, killing Osiris. There may be a lot of symbology involved, 
with respect to Osiris's role as Ra, the sun, so forth and so on, astronomical aspects. But in terms of the story, what happened is when 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 Set died, Seth died, he was he he was um what's the term I'm looking for? Memorialized, I guess, is a good one, and he took on the name as would to uh, King Tut. He became Set Uncommon. And Ankh uh, Amen simply means that uh, eternal is, is a reference to eternal life. Ankh life, Amen, you know, it, let mm-hmm. it be so. You know, these are the origins of a lot of, of Christian practices. So over time, Set Uncommon became Sat Ankh, became Satan. That's the origins of Satan as it stands. Now, when you get to the Christian elements with respect to Lucifer Morningstar, Lucifer means light bringer. So right. the role of the role of the devil in Christianity has never really been well articulated, but I think in a lot of ways he is supposed to serve, or the figure, the archetype is supposed to serve as a teacher, kind of like the the the, the polarity. There's, if Jesus is it serves as a teacher figure, so then too does Lucifer. They kind of work in tandem to be able to provide perspective, to understand a lot about. Christian, it's certainly Christian lives anyways, and it's not talked about, but again, there's been, there were so many revisions to the Bible, and there's definitely scientific information in the Bible, but there's also a lot of interpretation and conjecture that goes with it as well. Valuable, perhaps, in a lot of instances, but at the same time, it's about understanding the context of of, of so much that's written in there. And And there's a lot of things that are added and omitted, and that's why I'm excited about this new pope. He's retranslating the Bible and he's going to keep everything in and I can't wait to read the full extent of it instead of reading things that man wants omitted or added for their will. We can read what was actually there. A lot of it is about control, Tessa. A lot of the reason why the Bible has been utilized in the way that it has Christianity the whole notion of the bully pulpit or, 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 you know, again, the notion of fire and brimstone. So much of this has become ingrained in, in Christian life that there's not a real recognition of what was being communicated. I think the figure of Jesus, the information, the, the, the notion of Jesus really speaks to, number one, he was symbolic of light. The word Christ means light. There's no other way to put it. It does not primarily mean anointed or the anointed. Messiah does. But light, if you look at the word crystal, it means frozen or stalled light. And Christ was a euphemism or or, or a title more than anything else. And Jesus was his actual name or the figure's name. You know what I'm saying? In other words, that there was there was there was a lot of information that we don't hear. So I, I apologize. I know you've got your 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 boy. Oh, no worries. I'm listening and I'm hearing everything you're saying. Um, what, I, what I was going to say is that I focus on two of the most important things that Christ has, 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 has was alleged to have said. Number one is, uh, uh, have I not told you ye are gods? And that's a reference to human potential. It's, it's really trying to shed light on what we really are. That's what a lot of Christianity originally was about. The traditions were trying to really speak to the divinity in all humanity, in all life. And then the second part of the equation, which goes with that, is all these, he said, all these things I have done, you will do, and more. And this was really trying to communicate that we, we, we are all divine. We are all, we have, we, we are miracles based upon a confluence of events that allow us to be able to perceive things, have consciousness on a sustained basis, so that we're in a position that we can have free will, choice. You know, we can have some effect over our own destiny. That's what I think the biggest message is in all of this, is that we can have, we can make a difference, we can have an impact, ideally. But the nature of entanglement is such, particularly when you're dealing with 8 billion people plus any number of other fields that are being generated, I mean, it is just a, a thicket. There's no other way to put it. And it's, that segues somewhat into where I'm going to go next. What I'm saying is is that we do have limitations, but they're only because of our particular environment. You know what I'm saying? There, there well, yeah. are environmental limitations. Again, this, is, this gets into the her- heresy element of it. I am no longer viewing this, and I, there's, there's scientific 
evidence which has not really been acknowledged that gravity is not something that truly exists. It's an effect of magnetism as yes. is electricity. Basically, the only thing there is, and RL is going to talk about the fact that Ed Leedskall and, you know, put forth the notion of magnetons, where electricity, it simply means, the word electra is a Greek root, it means amber, because amber would create electrostatic effects. So it's a subjective term to begin with. If it's magnets, you know, the, if, if, if the quanta, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. You can say particles, you can say you know, waves that stop your both right. And again, Heisenberg talked about that, the double split slit experiment, which there is a, an excellent series of videos by a gentleman by the name of David LaPointe, where he demonstrates so many new views of scientific principles taken as givens. He really illuminates, no pun intended, the, the underlying essence of, of, of all this and more. And I'll get, in that, get into that a little bit later on. But what I'm saying is, is that basically there is no real gravity. We, our need to maintain structure, our need to be able to maintain physical form in an environment which is constantly giving us information which threatens our structure, we have to find some way because we can't take in all that information at once. You and know, I the, hate to um, interrupt sorry. you at this point, but we got to go to our first break. So oh, you guys, okay. don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after these messages. Looking for nighttime adventure? Old school radio that delves into everything out of the norm. Then check us out at Spaced Out Radio. This is Dave Scott. Every Monday through Friday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, we're going to take you on a wild ride ranging from conspiracies to true crime and every ghost, alien, and Sasquatch story in between. We're always live and we're always interactive with you. So join us at spacedoutradio.com, where together we own the night. Hey, guess what? You can now get your brand new Spaced Out Radio swag at spacedoutradio.com. We've brought the store back with all new items for you to pick out and pick up for yourself, your family, or friends. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, we got it all. All you have to do is head to our website and click on store. Choose what you want and it's shipped to you. The Spaced Out Radio store is right there for you. Come shop with us at spacedoutradio.com. Then we can own the night together. So you love talk radio. Then you'll love talkstreamlive.com. Talkstream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SOR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. If you're heading to Vancouver, make sure you stop by the official bar of Spaced Out Radio, the Moose Vancouver. It's the place to party in YVR at the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is always up to speed with a kitchen staff that serves great food, 
all food on the menu, $6.95 to $8.95. There's a reason the Moose Vancouver is recognized as one of the hottest spots on the West Coast. Get your horns up for the Moose Vancouver. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? A timepiece is a reflection of who you are, and what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio, or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You can follow Tessa on Twitter at Tessa TNT, on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to Spaced Out Weekend host, Tessa Nicole Thomas. Here's a sound again, voices dancing in my head. Hey guys, welcome back and thanks so much for hanging out with me and Mr. James Moses. Hey James, aka Jim, welcome back. It's so great to have you. Thanks again, Tessa. Uh, I was just uh, talking with you trying to remember where we left off and I was saying that with respect to things like gravity, it's understandable that that would be the only real relationship we have. There's not been a lot of effort to really uh, articulate what it is more the effect of it, you know, you know, the consequences. And the analogy I was starting to make to you is, is if you're falling from 10,000 feet uh, without a parachute at a fairly rapid rate of descent, it may be too fast in order to be able to reconcile what information, resonant information, would be present in our environment, which is air pressure to start with. If the air pressure is not equal to the pressure inside, you're going to get crushed. Too much information for the body the system to be able to reconcile it quickly enough. It's coming at, at it too quickly. And um, to say nothing of the ground being hard, no way to be able to really prepare for that kind of an impact, the force involved, the amount of information that the ground is rushing up at you with, is just too much to be able in most instances to avoid having the physical structure break down as a result, at least in, at least in part. The analogy I also make, which tends to bear out Einstein's theory as far as the speed of light goes, that uh, mass 
ceases to exist, we become infinite as a result of reaching the speed of light is for the same reason. There's far too much information at that rate of transit to be able to reconcile and maintain structure. It's just impossible. You know, there's no way for a structure to be maintained when you have just information just coming at such, it, 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 it's so fast that there's no way to be able to maintain the structure. And to me, that really is at the root of a unified theory is to understand <clears throat> that the information, if there's no way for a system or environment to reconcile that information, find a context which allows it to adjust, modify, evolve, then it's going to fail. It, it, you know, there's just it's it's that simple, and it's you know it, it's a multiversal concept. You know, regardless of the environment, that simple fact, you know, that really dictates whether or not something is going to continue to exist or whether it's not. Physically, is more of, of what I'm referring to, but even to a certain extent, there is some thought that the ethereal existence might be threatened under certain circumstances. Not one I want to give too much energy to or too much thought to. But um, these are things that are very different, you know, from people's perception. I think there's more of an open-mindedness now than there would have been in the past with respect to these things. At the same time, it's still something that t it's, it, there's an acclimation process, I think, with, you know, looking at these things differently, which is why I'm here, is to really try to make people more comfortable with the, the, the notion of these things as being different from how they're experiencing them, to be able to look at the reality more than the subjective experience. For sure. And I've heard these different theories from R.L. Poole, who's talking about L. Stalinin or Ed Stalinin um, and the Coral Castle and talking about gravity, how gravity is actually magnetism. You know, we have nickel and um, copper and all these different things in our core of our earth flowing around, etc., causing magnetism. It's actually magnetism pulling things towards the earth. It's not really gravity as we know it, but a magnetism that's pulling things. And if you have different things of different weight, they seem to fall at the same time frame, basically. It's pretty interesting. And I've watched several of his videos and um, different things that he's saying really make sense. So it's interesting, and, you know, Einstein was amazing, and he has so many awesome and amazing theories, but it's awesome to reach out and grasp different knowledge and to expand our knowledge and to go beyond what we originally thought was reality. And I think that that segues very nicely into a point I want to make with respect to constructive entanglement, which is at the basis of all existence, you know, whether it be with respect to consciousness, the ability to transfer information, transmit and receive, whatever analogy you want to use, it's all at the, that is at the root of it. The constructive entanglement is what allows for this. And in the instance of a planet, gravity being produced mainly as a result of the charge field being redistributed, the charge field simply a reference to the direction of spin, still magnetic, but again, it has that electrical connotation because we've been conditioned to think of charge as being associated with electricity. It only refers to direction more than anything else. The direction of spin of electrons, yes, but also the direction of, of whatever force is being generated, whatever information is being transmitted. Again, trying to keep within that metaphor as best as possible. But in the course of a planet being caused to revolve as a result of, or rotate more accurately, as well as revolve, but rotation is the primary consideration if you do have a magnetic dynamo and it is at an angle, over time you're going to be creating overlapping. You know, this goes on for thousands, millions of years. You're going to have a very dense overlapping of magnetic lines of force, which have already been identified. A, a graduate student in Australia was actually able to take photos of, of plasma, plasma tubes that are produced as a result of the Earth's electromagnetic field interacting with the uh, sun's wind, the stellar wind, that has a very direct bearing in terms of being able to provide that infrared light, which allows for life in the first place. What I call, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm on the fence because <laughs> I keep going back and forth, what I call electrostasis. And there's a gentleman also from Australia by the name of Kelvin Abraham, 
communicated a little bit with him. He is very, very, very advanced in terms of the model he has produced called Tetrionics. He is identified theoretically, and he refers to these things as quanta rather than particles, wavelengths, you know, trying to more or less just find some way of describing it, which covers all bases. That there is a type of quanta, a, a non-radiant photon, and why that's important is that, as, as David LaPointe demonstrates in one of the primer fields, or he calls primer field videos, constructive interference is, I've come to recognize, is what allows for life as well, because it means that you can regulate heat. It's non-radiant photons, standing waves that produce, uh, contain magnetic fields, entangled magnetic fields, which is us. I mean, we have polarities, you know, throughout our bodies. Each of our limbs has different polarities. And I believe that LaPointe has called to attention to something which is probably going to blow a lot of people's minds, but really shouldn't surprise them either. I believe that he demonstrates by virtue of the, of the invention he has a couple, he, he utilizes magnetic bowls basically to produce in the laboratory, among other things, galaxies, planets, nebulae. He demonstrates the pattern of distribution within electrically charged or magnetically configured would be the better description, gas or plasma. And as a result of that, I believe fairly strongly, though I don't know when it will be proved, that childbirth is ultimately predicated by a reversal of magnetic polarity. It's dramatic to see. So we had a question from the SOR Space Travelers. And this one's from Dell Elson, and he's wondering, what have you published? Have you published anything? No, Dell, I, I have not. I, my major focus, I have a page on Facebook, of, uh, it's in its eighth year now, called the Human Internet Radio Project. And I will explain why I haven't published anything really to speak of, because I, there's a lot of catching up I have to do. I'm kind of a late bloomer in some ways. I don't particularly like that expression. But um, I feel that there's an awful lot of time, again, subjective term, that's required uh, for, for, for being able to publish and focus. And I'm more about trying to get information out, insights out as quickly as possible. You know, this type of form for me is where I end up kind of provoking the thought, you know, changing the dialogue as much as possible. I don't have any real imperative to get published if I do as a result, that's great, but I would never look at getting – I have no interest in trying to publish a book. At the age of 56, it just takes up too much time, and it's even more isolating. The nature of a lot of our lives, my own included, is, is that we're very isolated at present, which is why the Internet becomes such a valuable resource. And I think that there are more and more people who are not necessarily looking to publish for that reason. The more that I have opportunities to be able to communicate these ideas – the more satisfied and gratifying it is for me. I don't need to have that hard copy, per se. Um, I, I hope this doesn't diminish me in your view at all as a result, but that's, that's how it is for me. I really don't have the luxury. There's too much else that I want to be doing at the same time, however prosperous I might be as a result of these endeavors. And I feel that a lot of people feel the same way. Like, life is too crazy and busy and, like, there's really no time to sit and type at your typewriter. But the cool thing is, all you got to do is um, get the Daily Journal app or something like that and record your daily thoughts or whatever you want for your book. And then you can send that into somebody and they can make a book out of it. So that's awesome. Um, that's a good way to get a book out there um, for people that want to read what you have to say. Um, but being on the radio is awesome as well. We can hear your thoughts and your processes and um, gain knowledge from you. And so that's awesome as well. You don't have to read a book to get knowledge. We can just listen to you right here on spacedoutradio.com. Um, but yeah, there's these different things you can do nowadays. Just make a, a verbal note and people can sit there and type it out for you and make a book for you. You don't have to sit at a typewriter or a computer or whatever anymore to write a book. You could just record your daily thoughts or different things that come to you and they could put it in order and do different things and, and make a book, which would be awesome as well to read it or have a book on, uh, on tape or CD or whatever it may be. All I can say is, is that I feel that the, the page on Facebook has been a very good um, outlet for a lot of that, Tessa. 
And um, in fact, I was going to mention, I'm hoping to be able to provide some sort of a resource to your listeners uh, after the fact that they can go and access a lot of these videos that I'm speaking of, maybe provide it directly to you. And then if there's any means of being able to post it, uh, you know, on the space site, I don't know enough exactly how these things work with respect to your particular venue, but I have posted a variety of different things repeatedly posted because they do have a high degree of importance. Um, a little bit more I wanted to touch on this, Dell, only because I know that I, I kind of cut off with respect to Tessa. Um, it's been a very, um, I've had a very extraordinary life, and in a lot of ways it's been very chaotic. You know, another word that I'm less than thrilled to use. A lot of upheaval, a lot of trying to strike a balance, and that's really what my goal is. This is something that allows me to indulge so much of the intellectual curiosity that I do have and share it, and there being much more immediacy in the process, as is the case with the Facebook page. I'm posting ideas. They're not, you know, they're not going away because I haven't sat down, and I've got stuff still rattling around in my head that I haven't really been able to pull together, but it will be definitely, a lot of the things that I post, I think that you will, everybody who is interested in what I'm having to say tonight or this morning will definitely find, you know, they're going to like it. There's a, there's a lot of resources that may not necessarily be evident. It, you've got to dig, and you probably have had that experience. A lot of you just, you know, you go on, on YouTube, and for whatever reason, the clouds part, and you just happen to get that video where it's like, wow, how did I not see this before? Yeah, the world around us is very intriguing. Um, Del was also saying, okay, information is not a physical thing like matter and energy information is part of world of forms, not physics. Take two, for instance, two does not exist in the real world. It is a formal concept or triangles. A true triangle does not exist because triangles are only theoretical constructs of points, which have no mass or energy and lines, which also have no mass or energy. All I will say to that is it's not been conclusively proven. There is definitely evidence that even just within the realm of numbers, whoever ended up inventing the numerical system understood that there is absolutely a, a correlation between um, coordinates within, within the vacuum anyhow. And again, it gets to entanglement. There, there are very specific resonant values with particular quanta three, six, nine being the most obvious. If you're familiar at all with what Tesla had to say and others have had to say, um, one of the videos that I'm going to post gets into it deeper than anything I'd ever seen previously. And I've already concluded based upon the particular attributes of those numbers that you're dealing with what is a reversal of, of charge or polarity because you've got the three and the six at the bottom that do not connect um, because of the numerical nature of them. And then you have the nine at the peak, which corresponds to a lot of the symbology associated, you know, numeral, numeral, I can't even say that word this hour, <laughs> numerological <Right>. symbology <laughs> that it, it ties in, you know, the nature the you know, seven represents this eight, nine, so forth and so on. My point is this, and, and, and two gentlemen, one by the name of Randy Powell and then his mentor, Marco Rodin, uh, who produced a dynamo, a toroidal dynamo, which uh, Hewlett Packard, he, he had asserted, Hewlett Packard did uh, tests on and was able to determine that it ended up providing 20% of what's known as over unity, which is the original or initial input. Um, there is absolutely a, a, information is real. The material aspect, the expression of it is simply, you know, where the distribution ends up being far more extensive. But information, if we're to, the problem with, with, with the standard physics model is it does not take into account the media. It really is that cut and dried. If you have a quanta value of any number based upon whatever characteristics are attached to that number, whatever the origins of, you know, the, those being assigned to that number, it's going to affect the media, which in turn affects everything in that media. Now, when you go back to the point that there's nothing within the media where it's a strict void, it's whatever ends up bringing in that initial information. And as I said, the initial input, original input is hard to really talk much about because there's not a lot you can say. But I firmly believe that there are very specific values to numbers, even without the quote unquote physical, physical expression. 
Nassim Harriman makes a very good point about this. If you do get the, I'm going to try to post the black hole video as part of this resource I'm speaking of. And he really illustrates the whole notion that the dot is the reality. That's the only reality it is because everything else is built from that dot. And that made complete sense to me. He, the logic is, is inescapable. And that's really all I can say in response to your answer. I, I think that if you look at it from a different angle than your typical physicist does, you will see that there is, that, that there is a relationship which is not necessarily evident to all of us. How numbers affect us, how resonant information affects us. And it has to do largely with the media that we exist in and the media that we are. We're mixed media. We're, we're, we're what I refer to as graduated field densities, each having their own characteristics. And this actually brings me back to something I wanted to mention before. If you end up exposing, uh, which talking about string theory, there's a very good microcosmic example uh, that's, that's readily um, applicable you have a fly, you have some sort of insect in close proximity to an electric instrument, a tip, you know, a bass especially because you're mm-hmm. dealing with some pretty powerful, you know... Vibration. With that proportion. That vibration is going to affect that insect as if he was in another dimension, universe, whatever the case. You've created a whole new set of environmental conditions that are in turn going to affect that insect which wouldn't have affected him before or it before until that information that's produced by the instrument is, is, is introduced into his environment. And somebody was asking, um, let me scroll back down here. They said you were going to share things um, for a post. Can you share your social media information so we can follow you? Um, it's on James Moses, right? On Facebook? No, actually, I try to end up keeping things separate from my from my, my wall. The name of the Facebook page is uh, The Human Internet Radio Project. Nice. Okay, so you should be able to find him and his thoughts and these different posts through there. Correct? Absolutely. Nice. And I know you have different bullet points, which I don't, but you have different things you want to speak on, and I don't want to interrupt those because I want to hear everything you have to say and all the information you have to share. Um, So let it go where it may. Um, What else did you want to share with us? Well, there's still a bit more to talk about, and it has a direct bearing in terms of our, our present condition. Uh, again, trying to find the best way to not interfere. The notion, one of the things I, I, I it, which is sacred to me, has become sacred to me, now that I understand more about what it actually is, 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 is this whole notion of namaste, which can mm-hmm. basically summed up as, I honor the path you take because it's necessary for you to take it. And it's more, for me, it's about providing the most information possible for people to make more informed decisions, not telling them what they should or shouldn't do. That to me is, is, that distinction is very important. Again, the original title of this was Truest Distinctions. And that was what I was trying to really illustrate in addition to the fact that we all are part of something really, I don't know, miraculous, whatever word you want to use. It wasn't a given that these sets of conditions were going to fall into place and we should just happen to be here. But the more we understand how it is we're here and where we are all at once, we, it's my firm belief there's enough, there's enough evidence around us that we exist simultaneously in, in multiple lives. I mean, the word lives almost seems like it's, it, it, it doesn't quite describe it to the extent I'd like, but it really does come down to that, that we are related to each other, each, each of our lives, our past lives and our future lives, reincarnation comes about largely because of transfer of information when it's applicable, when there's an instance where someone feels they need to move on to a life which the physical form has not fallen away or hasn't even come into existence. I do think that there may be instances whereby information that no longer can be retained in one life ends up being transferred into an existing body. 
And what exactly that looks like is hard for me to say with any certainty, but it makes a lot of sense when you stop to think about it. People end up acquiring new abilities. They end up having insights they never did before. There are catalysts, which all of a sudden value of which becomes very apparent. I use an analogy for me in terms of my, my biggest awakening occurred during the 90s. Uh, uh, my brother, I, I basically started getting involved somewhat with really getting involved with alternative medicine, learning more about it, advocacy. I had not taken the leap yet, and my health had suffered badly because I had environmental illness. I was working in a very sick building. And one of the metaphors that came across for me, across to me, one of the, the, the images, the visions that I had, which really allowed me to look at this whole notion of how the information it becomes apparent is that of a, of a fun house, house of mirrors. Those mirrors typically turn to, you know, in various directions. They rotate, but they may not rotate all the way around. And if yeah. the angle of those mirrors is just right, everything becomes clear or a lot more anyways. That's what this vision was like to me. In the late 90s, everything just started. Uh, that was when it really started in, in earnest for me. And my brother was not long for this world either. Uh, don't want to get too much into the particulars, but it was definitely a situation where my spiritual evolution was kicked into high gear and i i do have a very strong sense that what's been referred to in the bible as the quickening simply referring to the the the, the significant decline uh decrease in strength of the earth's uh, magnetic field which would produce a, 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 a more or less what would be called a quickening you would have far more information resonant information being delivered to you because the magnetic field would not be dampening it nearly as much so the word quickening in association with enlightenment, you know, expanded consciousness is, is very apt in that way. And I think that it was um, concurrent with that, you know, that it happened very much at the same time. I actually ended up attending and learning uh, how to douse at the American uh, Society of Dowsers in Vermont in 1996. It was just an amazing, amazing experience. I do teach people to some extent, but I'm not a professional dowser. I don't pretend to be. Had some really mind blowing experiences though up in Vermont, you know, uh, during the convention and uh, while the school was being conducted. So it was a time in the late 90s, I think, and then something just went so awry by 2000. And, you know, there's any number of different political events that occurred which could have contributed, but something changed. Something, we had a bit of a regression that occurred, is the way that I felt it. Even though we weathered Y2K okay, something happened, certainly 9-11 being another part of it, which I don't want to get into the political aspects, but I have some very strong opinions as to how we were affected by 9-11, and we've never really recovered in a lot of ways. There are, there are other things that have happened which would point to that, but what I'm saying is, is that so, much of the in, so many of the insights that I started to have began in the mid to late 90s as a result of this particular catalyst, where... There were things that were becoming apparent to me, you know, that, that, that everything just falls into place and you, all of a sudden it's like, now I understand. And you may not understand all of it, but you understand more than you ever have before. And I think yeah. this happens to people, and I think it's possibly because information is being transferred from another life where a body has, 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 has fallen away, you know, someone has physically died, you know, or that life. Has, has physically expired, whatever the terminology would be most articulate, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I feel the same way. Like, when that when 9-11 happened, like, so many windows and doors were opened to my soul. Like, I was seeing so many different things and so many actions and inactions, and it was just insane all the things that were happening. Um, and it really did open my eyes to a lot of things. I had already been in, in the military. I had already been a part of the government, which I swore I'd never do. That's why I never say never anymore. Although I just said it like a few times. Um, but it really did open my eyes to a lot of things. And there were things that I was seeing, like these energy weapons being used. There were no fires on these floors. And people were tearing off their clothes and jumping out windows and jumping to their deaths. Even though they weren't even on the floors of this extreme heat from you know, what they were saying, the the fuel from the fu fu fuselages or whatever were happening. Like, people were tearing off their clothes and jumping out because I believe 
that there were energy weapons directed towards this building that were causing people to jump to their demise and uh, do these different things. Like, and for security to be like, Hey, don't go anywhere. Just go back up to your office. Like that was ridiculous. Let everybody exit. Let, let everybody go out, but let's like add up the numbers. So many people were lost and so many lives were affected from this. And I feel so sorry and sad about it. Like it was a really, really sad time in our history. But on that There's note, a lot. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. You can continue. I didn't know. You were, you, you were about to say something. But I gonna, a couple of anecdotes I want to offer up about uh, 9-11. Uh, I mean, I, as I said, I have some very strong opinions about exactly why, and how it, why it happened and how. But the two things I was going to say, I watched a program on, I believe, either a, A&E or Lifetime. I can't remember which. Uh, and there was a, a child who had been reincarnated and uh the name of the person was withheld but another particular video i watched this online on youtube it was someone had uploaded it um and he dealt he had vivid memories of actually jumping out and landing and and he it was very difficult for him to be you know have to really process things easily because he was so young and but he had these visions um, and I think there's probably a lot of instances of that which have not been reported. Of like pure anxiety, like could you imagine? I can't. I can't wrap my mind around it. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's, it's hell. It's hell on earth. There's just no yeah. other way to put it. Um, there was two. Actually, there's a, there's three. But the second one, there was somebody that I knew in Canada who had been diagnosed or was about to be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and was starting to have some pretty powerful visions just before 9-11. And she said she had a vision at the time. We're, we're no longer communicating at this point for a variety of different reasons. But she had a vision of a volcano erupting on the East Coast in September. And I think she thought, too, that what she saw was the, the plumes of smoke that were erupting from the towers. Um, she ended up actually being detained, she told me. And again, I don't know how reliable that is because she had some Middle Eastern descent she was she she was afraid of being uh detained because of of what, what she was explaining to who what she would have been explaining to the people in, in question but the last note is is i actually saw the second plane fly over uh a uh, fairly well-known street the one i live on right now in massachusetts because the path from boston going towards new york there is a turn uh right around where i live there is a military base called Barnes to the south, and I was walking because I didn't I didn't have a car at the time. I was working in uh, in the community a uh, place called Mad Science. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. They're based out of Montreal. They do a variety of different experiments, primarily for kids uh, after school programs, presentations, birthday parties, and so forth and so on. But I was walking. I had just gotten started from where I was living. I was walking along this route. And I saw a plane, a commercial airliner, ridiculously low in the air. I mean, it was like a vision. It was so low. You just don't see this. Right. It was clearly a commercial airliner. It was not a military transport, which might be flying into barns. I know the difference. The colors are different. The shape is sometimes slightly different. This was a commercial airliner. It's like you start to ask yourself, did I actually see this? So I get to work. And I then am watching a plane fly into the towers. One is already smoking, and then I watch the second one fly in. And then at some point, I don't remember exactly when, whether it was that day or not long after, I put two and two together and realized I had seen the second plane fly right over me a half hour before it crashed into the, uh, into the South Tower. Yeah, and you can't compute it. Like, it's too much. It's, 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 it's not, it's so far out of context, Tessa, mm -hmm. the analogy I make, I don't know if you ever heard this before. It was said that the Native Americans who, uh, first saw Columbus's ship arrive, ships arrive to, uh, it was it Santa Domingo? I can't remember where exactly, somewhere in, in the Caribbean, had no context for wooden ships. They'd never seen them before. So they were invisible to them. And they were these people getting off. It's like, where are they coming from? It must be magic. The, um, I don't know, it's the Taino Indians or uh, the Arawaks, one of the two of them, they had no context for what a wooden ship would look like because they had never seen one. 
So it was very much along those lines. I didn't expect to be seeing a, a commercial airliner no more, I would say, than 300 feet over my head it w- and, and probably flying that low to somehow uh, evade Barnes's radar. Yeah, and you never know. There could be drones in the air, different things going on. Um, for this to be happening, like, you can change your flight path. And to us, it could be like, oh, well, maybe they had to change their flight path for a certain reason. But then these people are taking over the ships, a.k.a. aircraft, in order to do what they needed to do that day. And it was just so very sad. I had just moved into a house in Mancus, Colorado. And my uncle, I like to call him my uncle daddy because he was my uncle, but he was my dad once my dad abandoned us after my mom was killed by a drunk driver. And he called me and he's like, hey, are you watching the TV? And I was like, no, I haven't even plugged it in yet. I'm still kind of moving into my place. And if I plug my TV and I'm going to be distracted, he's like, plug it in now. You got to see what's going on. So I plugged it in, and that's exactly what you're saying. I saw the second aircraft hit. You could see where the smoke was coming from, where the first aircraft had hit, and then you see the second one, and there's all this footage going on, which they cut out on repetitiveness. You don't see the people jumping out. You don't see all these other things happening, but people are just jumping out to their deaths, and I was just like, oh, my God. Like, you could just feel kind of... I could, because I'm empathic and all these other things I could feel what they were feeling and all this anxiety and pressure and fear and loss of life and so many things. Like I was just like, Oh my gosh, like what would it take for you to do that? And like I was saying, the fire wasn't even on their, on their floor. It was just above them or sometimes below them. Um, but on these different things, you could see people jumping out and throwing their papers out and hoping maybe somebody would find, their work and all these other things going on. And it was just so hard to wrap my mind around. I'm like, Oh my God, what is happening? And it was kind of like, to me, the end of the world, like this is the end of the world. And I have my little one year old daughter with me. She's not quite a year old yet, but I don't know. It was so scary and out of, out of reach of the realm of reality for me. Like I could not wrap my mind around it and seeing these people taking off their clothes. There's no fire on their floor, but they're taking off their clothes and they're jumping to their death. And you could see them just jumping out all willy nilly and there's no fire on their floor. And I'm like, why are they jumping? Why aren't they trying to be safe? Why aren't they trying to do this or go down the floors below them? And I don't know. There's so many questions and so many lives lost. And it was such a sad, sad event and so much loss and peril and anxiety was the biggest thing for me that I was feeling was anxiety. Like you are kind of in that world of chaos and you don't know where to go from there. And people are just kind of jumping to their deaths and, and there could have been a different outcome. But at the same time, I believe there was energy weapons pointed towards this thing because why would people not just go back down the stairs and leave? Like is security really that powerful? No, not really. Like, just go past them. Like, I've gone past security several times. Like, whatever. You're just security. I would have done that instead of being like, hey, go back to your offices. Hey, stay up there. Do this, do that. And there were different vehicles spotted earlier that day. Different black vehicles taking gold out of the bottom of the building and all kinds of other strange things happening. Um, It was so weird and how people are just like, kind of like sheeple, like, Hey, go back up to your office. Everything's okay. Fuck you or F you. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to do what I need to do. And I'm not going to go back up to my office and be slaughtered like a damn sheep or a damn cow. You know, I think that there was a certain amount of shock that occurred, but I also wonder to a certain extent if there were directed weapons, particularly that would disrupt uh, their magnetic fields. In other words, that the, the level of the extent of disorientation, which would occur under the best of circumstances would be enough to cause people to end up acting what would otherwise appear to be irrationally. But I think their impression was, I think that the loss of equilibrium, when you have something like that, when you have that kind of really, really strong reverberation through a building, even if it stands, it's going to end up affecting people in a way that they will, they will react. They will panic. There's no other way to put it. And the thing that uh, there was a very, very high incidence. I don't know if you've heard a lot about this. I've read reports. It was allegedly the highest inc- recorded incidence of precognition 
with respect to the to towers, the knowledge that something very bad or very eventful was going to happen in history. The, you know, the percentages were off the charts. I don't have immediate access at this moment where I wouldn't exactly know where to look. But with respect to probability charts, any number of different things, there was a spike across the board, which, you know, would tend to indicate the extent of collective entanglement for whatever reason was far, far greater in the days leading up to 9-11. And um, the underlying reasons for 9-11, I could get into that. That would be one that would be a whole show of them by itself. Mm -hmm. There are historical aspects that I'm very much aware of and your involvement with the military. I, I would tread lightly if I talk too much about it. But the bottom line is, is that there there was a lot of presumptions associated with uh, how we ended up in this mess and continue to deal with this mess. Foreign policy is a disaster across the board. And, you know, that really speaks to the need to uh, stop making resources finite. If we've got the technology to be able to provide greater numbers of resources to various countries, try to establish a better balance of power or, you know, at a time when kids are not being brought up to hate other countries because of old, you know, very, very ancient animosities. Again, there's a lot of idealism I'm putting forth here. I recognize that. I'll be the first to admit it. The key is to try to turn it into reality. And that's the more that people start to think about these things differently, the events that have occurred since going back to Vietnam, going back to World War II. I mean, th that's, as I said, is a full conversation in itself. Mm -hmm. But coming back full circle, um, with respect to 9-11, I think that a lot of it was about changing the focus. And I think that it was kind of a double-edged sword. That's that's where I will leave it. Um, well, it's like these energy weapons do cause mass confusion and such. Like, people can generally think, no, I'm not going to listen to the security guard. I'm going to leave. But they were all willing to listen to them and go back to their offices. Really? You, you know, is your pay grade really worth that? But I think there was that mass confusion because of the energy-directed weapons, and it just kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where people are jumping out of windows when they really didn't have to. All they had to do was scale the stairs back downstairs, you know? All they had to do was leave, but instead, they're stripping off their clothes, they're jumping out the windows, and it was just so, so sad, and, and I really couldn't understand it. Um, but BTO in the chat room was asking... How did James connect with his own multiverse? Did the guest spiritually slash soulfully return to his unique universe within this particular multiverse and realized himself as a multiversal creator slash master? Does this multiverse consist of unique universes or parallel universes? How does the guest feel about mastering all universes, including this one, therefore becoming multiversal creators masters and are there a multiplicity of multiverses that exist within the omniverse what does the guest think regarding black holes um hold on i'm getting quotes here black holes I could black holes be entrance points or the universe add exit points into the multiverse Okay, let me see if I can take this on, and I apologize. I know where you're coming from, uh, and you, you said it was, I think you said it was initials that he led with, or she led um, with? Beyond the Omniverse is his name. Beyond the Omniverse, okay. Well, um, BTO, um, let me put it to you this way as best as possible. I think that the more we start, the starting point is, is with our own experience and understanding the nature of that. If there is, as I strongly suspect, evidence that will be discovered of, you know, in the lab with respect to quantum entanglement at that level, this family of lives, this, you know, where there's multi simultaneous existences occurring, I think it will be found that there are correlations for all of us, that the level of entanglement, the extent of entanglement between all these lives that we all have is going to produce a multiverse of and by itself. Correlation being, of course, that you have various galaxies, various celestial formations in all of these different parts of the omniverse. Universe, I, I just, I, if I understand him correctly or her correctly, I would, I would think that omniverse and universe are kind of the same general term. 
And that makes a certain amount of sense because universe kind of ends up making it sound like it, it, it's a bit distracting, especially since it's, it's, it's the common reference. But what I'm getting at is we are experiencing things and having a direct impact in our immediate environment, which is translating to people which have connections to others, to others, to others. The level of intricacy, in, intricacy, as I said, with respect to this entanglement is unimaginable. It's just it's beyond contemplation for too long in terms of trying to really wrap your head around the physical aspects. But the patterns of expression, you know, the conceptual aspects are a lot easier than we might think otherwise. Um, there is this, this notion of, as you're talking about with respect to black hole singularities, first of all, I think that Hawking was absolutely right. I think that the evidence would point towards white holes, that there is a toroidal or cyclical nature to these, which means that the information which is being taken in by this singularity, where there has been such displacement that's occurred, collapse, cavitation is, is, is my favorite word. I mean, basically, if I combine the two words, I call it gruck cavitation because that's essentially what it is. Gravity comes about as a result of cavitation for the reasons I've talked about already. But in terms of black holes, there's no question that there's a distortion that occurs to the fabric of space, which is the media. Transmutation of the media changes the values whereby you're in a position, and this is warp technology, and I'm going to be talking about this shortly on my on the Human Internet Radio project. I just have had a lot of difficulty knowing how to be able to phrase it. Uh, frame it is a better word. Yes, wormholes exist. There's no doubt about it in my mind. There's evidence all over the place now, both experientially as well as conceptually. You know, theoretically, it's being borne out as well as in the lab. A lot of quantum experiments are demonstrating that wormholes, a tunneling effect occurs where the distance between two points is shortened as a result of changes to the media. It's just about the density. How far can information travel, a resonant value travel through a specific media? How is it distributed as a result? What systems are already in place within that media to be able to reconcile the information that's being introduced. How much is, the, is that media being threatened? In the instance of a black hole or a wormhole, which again, it's talked about, the wormholes may not be something that can be maintained indefinitely. And there's truth to that because again, it, it, it depends upon, as I've said, going back to the analogy of the stones and the, and, and the body of water, that information has to be maintained in order for the, the wormhole to be maintained. Whatever information allowed it to form in the first place has to constantly be provided if it's going to continue existing. It only makes sense. It's not going to, once it hits a certain point, be self-generating unless it's of a toroidal basis. And even then, there are still sources of information which allow for toroidal uh, you know, singularities, vortices, however you want to phrase it. So that's the context that I see for, for black holes and singularities in a multiverse is that they are, yes, indeed, shortcuts because there's a transmutation, a distortion of the media, but also they act as, uh, you've heard the term, uh, lenses. Information is being directed towards various sources as a result of it being uh, reconciled, uh, in, uh, taken in by these singularities. And there are singularities everywhere. At the, you know, we know now, this is something that Nassim Harriman was a leader in, that we know now that all galaxies, all galactic formations, pretty much everything in existence does have a vortex at its center because it's what allows for the cyclical nature of the information to be distributed throughout a system. Not all systems are toroidal, but there is at least in part some part, you know, some part of it is going to have a toroidal nature, going to have vortices scattered throughout. And that's, you know, based at the basis of Randy Powell and Marco Rodin's Dynamo is that basically they have nested vortices where there's an alternating. Uh, it, it, it's it's basically on and off, and which is why it doesn't fall apart. Why there isn't a shearing effect, and I'm getting into some 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 denser stuff. No pun intended, but I hope that answers your question. It, it, it they make complete sense. Uh, Hawking's premise, more than anybody else's, is is very sound for the most part. There's still some things to be determined, but he was out in front on on this in a lot of ways. And Hawking's was very against us communicating with alien life 
And it's interesting, I was watching the show called Alien Contact and Outer Space, and um, they were talking about black holes, how it sucks everything in, even light, but then you see these spurs of light and different masses coming out of the black hole, and it's basically impossible in our thought form. Like, this cannot be happening because it sucks in light and all these different matters around it, but these things are coming through. So it makes you wonder, is this a actually alien life forces coming through and using black holes as portals? And I think it could be. Like, they have this certain technology where they can get past the gravitational pull of the black hole, and they can actually come out instead of everything going in. You never see these light dispersions going out of the black hole until... Oh, man, I can't remember what year it is. And I'm trying to look through my notes when I watch this show. Um, let me see. Can I find it? I'm not finding the year, but it was not too far along ago where these light expulsions were coming out. And you could see this mask come out. And it was like they're using it as a shortcut from their dimension to ours. And so it was interesting to see that. And it gives you a whole different perspective of what the black hole is. Like these different... Races are using this as a way to get in and a way to get to our world and kind of investigate us. I guess we're really, really interesting, but um, at the same time, we're not that far evolved. We are actually a century behind where we should be. We were going along, going along, doing great. We should be a century ahead of where we're at at this point, but we kind of digressed because that's what the government wants to do with us is digress us and kind of keep us in a black hole of our own, you know, um, keep us from expanding and evolving. They want to keep us under wraps and under control when we should be driving, flying cars and doing all these other things. Um, we're a century behind where we really should be at this point. I think that one of the things that, that really comes across to me, having grown up in the sixties and really being exposed to a lot of notions about what the 2000s were going to look like that are radically different from what the reality is. In some ways, it's more unbelievable and others less unbelievable. You know, the whole notion of flying cars and so forth. I'm not somebody that necessarily says, how do I put this? Before we start to even think about how we're going to express technologically, we need to figure out what kind of people we want to be, what kind of species, what kind of society and the problem is there are so many conditions attached to just living now in order for someone to be able to derive, you know, a better living. It, it, it's about one of my themes, Tessa, more than anything else, if you read any of my postings on my wall, comes up occasionally on the Human Internet Radio Project is the universal, the, the common denominator with respect to human misery has to do, and it goes back thousands of years, but never more so than within the last 50 to 75 is the externalization of societal value, whereby in order to be able to participate in some of even the most basic activities within a society, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and certain people benefit as a result. So what you're talking about is very real, but we've reached a point where the technology is making it less and less viable. You have a greater number of people who are opting out of consumer society, which is not to say that they aren't materialistic, but they're more conscious of what it is that they're purchasing and i think this is largely a rebellion against the expectation that they're going to you know that they're, they're they're obligated to do any number of different things to support an economy which does not really allow for the greatest amount of freedom and that's where we're at in a lot of ways and the purpose of me coming on tonight is partially to illustrate the more that we have an understanding of just how amazing each of us is and the more that we make demands that society be reflective of that, regardless of, of racial background, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, any of that stuff, the bottom line is, is about letting people live as, as, as they see fit. Not, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have to like any aspect of the way they live. Just understand that, you know, the whole notion of live and let live, namaste, it's it's you know free it's not free agency rock. and free will like everybody should be able to live the way they want to how is it our place to judge like let them be what they need to be and live your life as you should and part of the problem is is the fact you have people that depend upon a perception of uh, inferiority 
You know what I'm saying? In terms of because someone else has acquired a piece of paper, someone else is now making it maybe not as a direct result, a hundred thousand or, you know, six figures that somehow that makes them a better person, that they've done more, that they've, you know, they've played the game. Well, the game is no longer what it was. And I don't think a lot of people in those positions really understand yet. I think some of them are starting to begin to understand. My point is, is that if we are resonant beings, if we're constantly receiving this information, if we have insights, if the perspectives are arriving to us much more immediately than they have in the past, all of a sudden we don't need the middlemen the way we used to. We can make decisions as to whether or not we want to involve them. You've got the internet, which is a huge information resource, you know, and I don't care what anybody says, this whole notion of fake news, nine out of ten times, most people are able to arrive at their own conclusion. You know, that they're not so incapable of making informed decisions for themselves. And this is at the root of why our medical system is, is, is basically still back in the dark ages because mm-hmm. they don't understand this. Because so many trillions of dollars are at stake between the university systems that continue to underwrite this model as well as the pharmaceutical industry, the hospital complexes, you know, the insurance companies. It is a conspiracy. There's no real other way to use it because it really is. It, it, it's completely deceitful. It has no bearing on our well-being at all. and It's all about the almighty dollar, which is the root of all evil. Well, again, the root of all evil is the externalization, externalization of value, societal value. Each of us makes a decision as to what is valuable to us. But when people who have no real vested interest are making those decisions by, by proxy, that's where the problem arises. Money is just the instrument to maintain the externalization of societal value. That's well, on that real- note... Um, Sorry, we sorry. have to go to our second break. Oh my. I know it goes so fast, right? I was saying there's never enough time. It goes so fast. Um, but we do have to go to our second break. So you guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after these messages. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the <sighs> town. The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. 
No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com there is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us. From radio commercials to banners and social media, have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Hi there, this is Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio, and I want you to come on a nightly journey. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, every Monday through Friday, you can come hang out with me and the other space travelers. We have it all from Carl the Alien bouncing on by to those misfit gnomes causing havoc. It's three hours of fun and entertainment on those topics the mainstream really doesn't want to touch. Come get all paranormal with us at spacedoutradio.com. And together, my friends, along with our resident guitar god, Bumblefoot, we own the night. Sit back, relax, grab a drink, and listen closely. Spaced Out Radio continues through the weekend. From the mile-high mountains of Colorado to you, listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Weekend with Tessa Nicole Thomas. Wow! <laughs> I always love that intro. Um, but welcome back, James Moses. It's so great to have you this evening and all your different perspectives. Welcome back to the show. Thanks again, Tessa. Um, I just wanted to wrap up what we were talking about with respect to you had mentioned uh, a very common perception that money is the root of all evil. And it definitely is an instrument or tool to perpetuate evil. And what I mean by that is, is that true evil in my estimation, is about the unnatural perpetuation of need. 
where people are forced to mean something because it ends up allowing for others to derive a, uh, a, a sustainable income. You know, that in other words, that they continue to get money as a result of maintaining the need. Uh, that's something that's got to stop. And this is why I spoke in the past, uh, this, this program, uh, the notion of uh, less finitized resources where people are allowed to really pursue um, their lives in a way where they're not worrying so much about where their next paycheck is going to come from, whether or not they're going to have a roof over their head, heat, especially at this time of year in, in the Northeast, throughout much of the northern United States. That's what I'm talking about. And there are a variety of different opinions. Uh, the whole political angle, I, it would take me a while to really present a lot of my ideas, but I do have some, and there's some that correlate with those that, you know, progressives and, and conservatives are, are, are presenting alike. But um, I, I take a very different tack. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, what I refer to myself as, as an alternative centrist. Well, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Well, a lot of it comes down to understanding that there are three aspects with respect to our economy that are in direct conflict with each other. One, in a society where choice is, is paramount, you know, that free choice, un, un, unimpeded choice is supposed to be, let me put it this way, supposed to be paramount. You cannot have either party in a potential transaction suffer as a result of the other failing to complete that transaction, whether it be the seller or the buyer, and that it does is allowed to continue to happen, very much an expression of Darwinian theory as well as Calvinistic thinking that, again, is, is very antiquated in a lot of ways, demonstrates a lack of non-denominational faith, which is essential for a society to even survive in the first place to, to persist. That's one problem right there. The second part of the equation is the fact that so much of what will allow for support of those two parties directly depends upon the availability of income, that being the social net, the municipal tax structure is on the verge of collapse because people cannot afford to continue paying into it. Taxes for people that are making less than $100,000 has become, they become prohibitive in a lot of instances, you know, and, and that's just not a good situation. It's not a truly progressive tra tax structure. Those who are making billions should be paying more, millions, you know, $100 million. The idea, the notion that I have with respect to, and this is a very, a lot of people kind of recoil at the notion, but I think that in a society where that problem persists as far as the expectation of purchase, if there's no money available, there's got to be money provided. Even Henry Ford himself acknowledged that. If I don't pay them, then how are they going to buy my products, the products that they make? So there needs to be a universal basic income. And I have very clear ideas as to what would work best given the particular economic circumstances that are not going to change appreciably. Um, for these reasons and more, there needs to be a way of people to support themselves. And if the ability to make choices with respect to that money is greatly increased to them as opposed to other agencies providing it, I think that allows for more creativity to come to the forefront, for there to be more opportunities to be self-sufficient, relatively speaking, not completely self-sufficient. I think the government definitely has a role in terms of providing services, goods, you know, bulk discounts, as it were. That's really what a lot of it comes down to. But it, with a fair, a lot more choice available. Then the third part of the problem is, is the fact that you do have finite resources, that you have people are entities that have monopolized those critical resources that pe others like me, like you, like a lot of us can't start businesses, can't, you know, undertake ventures to try to improve the quality of many lives. Those three factors make it impossible for this economy to continue as it is, and it won't, and it's not going to be pretty. So this is one of the biggest changes we're confronting. Definitely concerns about the environment, you know, the impact but I think the nature of climate change is not fully understood. There is absolutely a celestial aspect to it with respect to changes to the heliosphere. The sun is undergoing very significant changes with respect 
to um, warming changes in climate uh, extremes, going from extreme cold to extreme warm. The stability of the ecosystem is being affected by things going on beyond our planet. And this is not something that's being communicated consistently or even all that much by NASA, although they do allude to it in some instances. So many, so many challenges that are confronting us that are not necessarily evident um, there's enough evidence if you look at a lot of the chaos out there, a lot of the upheaval, you know, the number of shootings that have occurred, the amount of just real failure to understand why things are happening, the inability to feel amongst a lot of people. They've just become so desensitized for a variety of different reasons. That's not a good healthy, that's not a good situation, healthy situation at all. And I mean, you and I both being, and probably a fair amount of the li- your listenership, having empathetic tendencies, sometimes, obviously, it becomes overwhelming. And y- each of us finds a way to be able to kind of protect ourselves from being overwhelmed as a result of feeling so much. There's the other side of the coin where people just completely decide not to feel, and it makes it difficult for them to relate to a large number of others. You know, uh, there are there is an attitude about emotions that they don't have the same value as quote-unquote facts. You hear that constantly from people that have been conditioned to believe a very specific way, almost to the extent of it being a religion. Science being, you know, conventional science being a very good example of that, conventional medicine. They don't understand a lot about the real value of things because they're not encouraged to deliberately because that would compromise the ability to derive a very, very generous income You know, maintain that need. Yeah, you've got this condition. You've got to continue to take this medication. If you don't take this medication, then this will happen. We're certain of it, even though it's, you know, it might have happened with another person. Each of us, it's not a one size fits all scenario with respect to health. And and, and this is something that alternative modalities understand implicitly. I've been involved with a homeopath and naturopath for over 20 years, and I've learned more from him than I've learned, ever learned in school. Uh, you know, definitely informed a lot of the research that I've done, and I've tried to communicate that as much as possible. Uh, there is a very specific scientific principle that underlies homeopathy. It's what I call the diminution paradox, and it simply means that the most simple expression of anything is going to be easiest to reconcile by an existing system which is to say that without the side effects that occur as a result of all sorts of other ingredients to supposedly expedite uptake, um, you don't have the same problems. You've got something that's immediately identified. The nature of homeopathy, for those who aren't familiar with it, there is what Samuel Hahnemann referred to as succussion, and it's about banging. It seems kind of almost primitive when you think about it, you bang the bottle a specific number of times and you end up increasing the potency, even though you have diminished the actual material in the, in, in the suspension. Well, your typical conventional science, scientists will say, well, how can that be possible? There's nothing left. There's nothing that will act. You know, there's, not, there, there's no active ingredients that will produce a specific desired effect. And the problem is, is they don't understand. It's the information that's been now distributed throughout the suspension electrostatically. Again, we'll call it magnetostatically. I don't know. It's not a word that rolls off the tongue. My point being is is that there is a shell that's formed around the nanoparticles, and the more you strike it, the thicker the shell gets, so the greater the resonant potential. And then at that point, whatever part of an organic system needs to assimilate it is going to be able to recognize it much more easily with a lot less stress. This is something that really is at the core of resonant medicine. It's about tailoring, designing in a very organic way, specific resonances to produce effects within the media that's being affected by something else adversely or undesirably. Cancer being a a form of evolution, as someone uh, in in, in a video spoke of tonight, it's about trying to, it's the struggle to reconcile new information or different information. Mutation being an expression of something that would be new information. The body has to figure out a way of reconciling it or finding a context or else its existence or at least part of its existence is threatened. You know, you have a tumor, it metastasizes. 
it, it's distributed throughout the system because the information suddenly becomes part of the database, to use the co computer analogy again. How do you end up reconciling it? How do you end up finding a way of either eliminating the virus or understanding that it's part of an evolutionary process that is everywhere around us? It's how distinct organisms come to be in the first place just by altering the field which is being produced by a quanta going back to the very latest beginning a field that a quanta admits if it ends up having new inter information introduced it, it's going to change that translates to fields that are being produced by material objects life life forms organic systems however you want to put it whenever you're going to introduce information the potential exists to produce in turn an evolutionary process or a, a, an alteration to key characteristics depending upon how fixed is that particular system and this brings up something that I mentioned in the last appearance some of your listeners may be aware that uh, who, who know what the Schumann resonance is and that is for lack of a better term the aggregate resonance produced by this planet it's kind of a, 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 um, a guide for any number of different life forms, including ourselves, to organize different processes. And when that changes, it would be inevitable that there would be very specific changes occurring. We've had change from 7.8, fairly static 7.8, uh, up to 11.3, and now we've had a couple of instances at least where it spiked to 110 hertz. In my estimation, that can only change. That, that's an enormous evolutionary change in theory. What would prevent it from happening? I don't know. I can't say for sure, but I do know that the dynamics seems to be very sound from a theoretical standpoint. The other thing about that is, is that some oracles that were built thousands of years ago, trying, one I believe is Delphi, if I'm not mistaken, parts mm -hmm. of them have a resonant value of exactly 110 hertz. That cannot be an accident. Somehow they either had they, they had knowledge of the Schumann resonance or they knew that there was going to be a major shift. You know, the mind reels to contemplate how they would have been aware of something like that. And it's interesting because when you're trying to get rid of cancer and you try to cut it out, the body actually feeds the cancer. It causes those growth hormones in order for your body to heal. It's feeding the cancer again with growth hormones which makes the cancer come back like five times more um and we're talking about fear in here and people are saying um fear is what um we're born for hunting the buffalo and mammoths and so on and so forth but i don't really think it's about fear it's about adrenaline and people are saying adrenaline is fed by fear which could be one component but there's also testosterone um anxiety other different things not just fear that feeds that um and there was another point i had okay with the government so we had from tesla free energy and all these different things that we could have had instead of paying to these other people um we could have had free energy and been able to live off of that but instead the man's keeping us down with hey let's pay this guy for energy yada yada that's why tesla didn't win these certain things that's why his he wasn't murdered by it, but his credibility and his character was killed by it. And so they said he didn't know what he was talking about, but this guy does. When in all actuality, Tesla really had the answer. And by the time he died, he had, oh, I want to say like 80 to 100 different crates full of information from his blueprints and information and technology that he had built upon. By the time we get to his body, there's only like three crates left. Um, because the government goes in there and tries to take all the knowledge away from us. Even with aliens, aliens and UFOs have been here since the beginning of time. Even when you look at Mary holding little baby Jesus, you see UFOs in the background. You see these different alien wars and paintings in the, and you know, back in that time. And they're trying to tell us these things don't exist because people's heads might explode and, and there's going to be all kinds of chaos and different things happening because of it. Um, I think we're ready for it, but still, they're lying to us. They don't want us to know because there's certain things that we can gain from it and certain things that will take away from their power. I think that there's some truth to that, but I also think that part of it has to do with the fact 
you're right. I mean, again, fear is a, at the root of a lot of the the uh, justification by governments because they don't have enough faith that people. Again, this is this is this conflict goes back. The, the notion about humanity, at least in modern times, goes back to the French Revolution. It was a conflict between Robespierre, who had the Calvinistic view that idle hands are the devil's workshop, and I use that term euphemistically. And then you had de Tocqueville, who basically represented more of the enlightened view that said man is essentially good when provided with sufficient resources to belie or, or to mitigate his, his animal instincts. And the only reason we have animal instincts is because of finite resources. That perception of finite resources has more or less been perpetuated for a long time. And it's what's allowed this economy a very cannibalistic economy by nature. Capitalism is, has a very you know, cannibalistic aspect to it that it ends up becoming corporatism, monopolies, all these things based largely on the externalization of value. Oh, in order to be this great person, in order to, be, to have do great things, I have to make this amount of money. I have to end up selling this. It becomes, a, you know, chasing after that brass ring, it, you can wake up and realize that you're, you know, already two thirds through your life. It never interested me. My father was very caught up in that mindset, largely being an immigrant, uh, you know, having that, that, that very big, you know, make, a, make something of yourself, you know. And it's not a bad thing, but there are different ways to go about it. There are different approaches to contributing value to, to, your, to your community, to your society. And that's what really needs to happen. We need to create, you know, a form of government a relationship with government that ends up acknowledging that there are different ways of people being able to do that, you know, where they're, they're, they improve. They're, they're constantly, particularly those with the most creative impulses, are have the greatest potential to improve, constantly be improving upon, revitalizing a society. And that's been missing from the equation in terms of the number of people that are allowed to be part of that process. Um, so, yes, I, I, with respect to the electric companies, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think that all things being equal, their time is – the, the sunset is approaching for them as much as for combustion technology. Uh, I think the 2030 benchmark is, is, is reasonable. I have problems with people that want to force the issue because it doesn't acknowledge the economic reality. There's no way that most of this country can afford electric vehicles. It's not an option, let alone new ones. You know, I have a used one. Uh, you know, I'm going to continue to have used ones. Most of us are not making enough to be able to go out and buy an electric vehicle, yet they keep forcing the electric vehicle technology. And the fact of the matter is, it's going to be obsolete by the year 2030. The, the technology which is beckoning that is going to replace it changes things beyond it's just inconceivable uh you know being able to derive moisture directly from the atmosphere as the vehicle is in operation and hydro hydro hydrolysis process where the you know the water molecule is split so that hydrogen is provided in a, in a stable way possibly driving a fusion based type of engine i mean the possibilities are are pretty amazing I am hearing a cat on the other end. Yeah. Oh, I My, think that's Cleo wanting to get in. My producer. Come on, Cleo. <laughs> Midge, sound off. Come on, boy. Come on, Kilo. I call her Kilo because she's like the killer cat. She's teaching the little kitten how to kill rats and mice. We don't really have rats. We have mice. But, yeah, she's Kilo. She's the queen of killing all the lower species. My chocolate point is purring. I don't know if you guys can hear it or not, but now he's just sniffing me. All right, enough of that. I don't want to waste time. We're, we're close to, you know, again, I know that you guys, we're, we're almost up to 2.30, and we've covered a lot of ground, but what I was going to say, some things I want to touch upon just to mention because I didn't have a chance to get to them. In terms of the whole notion of how we've arrived at the point we have, you know, with, with the periodic table of elements, the original information having been so entangled, so altered in the course of billions of years that we've got expressions, constructive, what's known as constructive expression, uh, expressions, they're built on top of each other. For example, as I pointed out in the last show with respect to the purple plates, there's a reason why aluminum is easy to reconfigure as a metamaterial because of the fact 
silicon is right next to it. It has a crystalline structure, even though it has it's an you know there's isotopic values to it. It still has the potential to be able to be reconfigured. These these elements are built on each other, and a gentleman some of you may have heard of by the name of Walter Russell really created a a, a very very easy to internalize periodic table based on the way that the, the real structure occurred, the way the evolution, the decay, or the the changes to each quanta that would produce a new element, the number of neutrons or the number of you know the number of electrons, the, the you know the protons, so forth and so on. Whatever these, however these particles, these quanta end up becoming what they are today, they were not once that. There was just this unified bit of information which diversified as I say, over the course of eons and eons and eons and eons, billions and billions and billions of years, this time, what came before it, as I say, we can't even re- really kind of look at that for long without our you know, our eyes starting to glaze over. But when we get to the point you're talking about single-celled organisms, those combined with other ones to collaborate in order to support even more complex systems, same, it, it's reflective again of how elements came to be, you know, that one element would produce, combinations of two elements would produce another element in one way or the other. Um, and as time, quote unquote time, you know, as, as things passed, you had a situation where more and more complex organic systems that were reliably coherent, that information could continue to be distributed. And I should say this, I mean, the most obvious example of information, resonant information, is speech. You know, the sound of my voice, the sound of Tessa's voice, that is an immediately recognizable form of resonant information. But that's only a subjective experience because of the fact that we have the ability to hear it within that range. That particular wavelength is what our ears have been configured to perceive. You know, different types of wavelengths of light, our eyes pick up on that, our third eyes, our pineal glands, are, are utilizing that in ways which are still not fully understood, but certainly there's enough evidence that it played a crucial role, uh, as, as well as other parts of the brain in, in, in human history. So much of this is about understanding that as a result of having our particular senses available to us, what we're perceiving is subjective. There's truth in it, but it's not the whole truth. And the more we seek the whole truth, the more we can understand why there are things that are not easy to reconcile. Um, you know, it's really, it really is that simple. We have the ability to make, a, a, because of the information that we're receiving, the level of intelligence we have in the best of circumstances, all things being equal. And I use this term very, very provisionally, I, with some reluctance. We have witnessed for all a, a certain amount of a dumbing down that's occurred because they don't want us to think for ourselves. A lot of people in power know the minute that we start thinking for ourselves and are able to make informed choices, that we become a threat to their existence, their source of value, their reason for being. And it shouldn't be like that, but it is. Unfortunately, that's the nature of things. I think that the potential for change has never been greater. There are definitely things which will improve conditions on a political scale to provide real electoral reform so that we do have our choices. But one of them that's critical in all of this that goes back to what we're talking about here is the ability to make choices with respect to our health. And those are being in, infringed upon more than ever right now. And that's something that causes me grave concern because I do understand the underlying science with respect to vaccines and why they are so dangerous on a lot of levels. And I don't know how many people support vaccines in this in, in this community, but I can tell you there are far, far better alternatives to be able to condition the way that a, an immune system that has no re- reference point, you know, itself. It may have a genetic reference point, but there's a lot of alterations that occur to what it's familiar with previously that are going to make it difficult for it to be able to re- respond in an informed way. Uh, it's not just vaccines, though. It's various pharmaceuticals. It's the attitude about alternative medicine to this day, the failure to be able to underwrite so much of it because we understand the value. Those of us who have taken the time and have had the experiences know what that value is. And the fact that they don't respect our intelligence, 
enough that we, we, we are capable of making informed decision choices. This is, this is why things have got to change more than anything else. Whatever else changes emerges as a result of climate alterations, you know, changes that are going to have very definite global impacts. If the people that are supposed to be involved in making decisions about how we respond on our behalf aren't capable of even recognizing that we do have ideas about how it might be made more simple or less painful, this is, this is why we're struggling as much as we are is because the relationships, the nature of the entanglements are not healthy in a lot of instances, and that's, that's got to change. It really does got to change. Indeed, it really does. Sorry, my cat is clawing the crap out of me right now. Go away, producer. <laughs> um, Midnight crazies. Yeah, they're like ready for the night to be over. Now she just left the office. I don't even know how she opened the door. That's weird. <laughs> is, she, is she any sort of purebred or just a, uh, a tabby? No, she looks like um, one of those tuxedo cats. She's got the black and white going on. and. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're supposed to be so good natured. <laughs> Yeah, she's just I guess that's she, universal. Yeah, she's been really high strung and then my cat Wonky got killed and he had a um thing when he was born he was um handicapped because of what happened in in utero and he'd run with his butt going sideways or he'd jump and it looked like somebody threw the cat up in the air. Um different things like that and then he got killed by the dogs, which was really, really sad. I was not here for oh, that. Sorry, I was in Phoenix. That. But after so that yeah, me too. I miss him so much. But after that, she really, really calmed down. And then my husband, of all things, brought a kitten home, which he had been investigating for a long, lengthy amount of time. And I was like, why don't you just bring it home instead of going and petting the pussy every night? Um, and he finally did. And she just totally um, adopted it. And she was so protective of it. And she thinks it's her kitten, even though she's never had kittens. She took on that mother perspective. So it was very interesting to see that. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting how she just opened the door there. There's no way for her to do that, but it just popped open and she went out and so I closed it behind her, but that was pretty They're intriguing. Clever. Cats are very, very clever. Siamese in particular, having had two, I can attest to that. If they need to get somewhere, they will. And, uh, yeah, the, you know, the paws are, are useful instruments. My, my blue point used to have the interesting habit of being able to straddle the top of a door. That something or even a door jam for that matter, a lintel. And it's very, very distracting to see. It's like, how is he doing that? Right? They just have this different thing going on. And it's interesting how they can see things sometimes before we do. Um, when Wonky was still alive, he once came over and ran in between my legs and was hiding in between my legs and looking around. And his head was darting back and forth. And I was like, what is he looking at? Um, all of a sudden, we saw this little kind of like electrolyte, like, fireworks or whatever going off at the ceiling which there was no fireworks it was kind of some sort of entity up there and he watched it bounce around until finally it was up there and showed this light show and then all of a sudden it disappeared but he was kind of I don't know if he was protecting me or what but it's interesting how animals can catch on to things before we can no matter how in tune we are sometimes they're more in tune than we are I think that in a lot of ways that they may be more aware of, of, of the quote-unquote multiverse than we are. For one thing, and I don't know if you've heard this, and it's the craziest, probably the craziest thing a lot of people will ever hear. They're said to be able to bilocate, and I have seen that happen. It's very freaky, but basically there'll be one place, and then they're another place, and they're still standing in front of you, and it's like, how did you get over here? That, and it, it's, it defies the laws of, you know, the perceived laws of physics uh, my blue point, basically, after I had to put him to sleep, he had both cancer and renal failure, and he had been wearing one of the purple plate discs around his neck. I, I'm fairly convinced that, coupled with the large plate I had under my pillow, did keep him alive at least another year or so, as the vets actually conceded something. You know, he shouldn't have been around, but um, hardest decision I ever had to make in my life. And I almost had to, you know, my mother, you know, being my mother's, executor that was also a fun little task um i'm grateful that i wasn't the one that had to make any sort of decision um but what i was going to say is even after you know i put him to sleep 
And I got this this, this rascal. Uh, he's a handful. He still is even now. He was a rescue. He's going to be 10 this year. Um, Henry hung around for almost a month. I constantly saw him. I, there's no doubt I saw him. It was not my imagination. And they do that. They don't go away right away. Mm-hmm. Because they're that entangled with you. They're the... the he was, for all practical intents and purposes, my familiar. That, there's just no other way to put it. The, you know, when you take care, when you're responsible for the well-being of something to such an extent, you know, you're going to bond to. You're just going to bond that much. And he was as much of a sweetheart with humans, not so much other cats, as any I've ever met. I mean, he would just he'd jump into your lap with, you know, the drop of a hat. Even if you weren't a cat lover or even a cat person, if you didn't like cats. Henry would be one that ended up changing her mind nine out of ten times. Yeah, they are so in tune and so amazing. And it's really hard to grasp what they're seeing because we can't see it. They just have that different vision than we do or that different observation ability. Um, yep. And it's so amazing. I guess basically since we're coming down on three o'clock, uh, you know, if there if there's questions people have, Still, um, I can talk about a number of different things, but I know that I've, I've, I've pretty much had the floor a lot of the evening, a lot of the morning. And if there were still some remaining questions people had, even not necessarily related to this particular topic, you know, uh, I'm more than willing to, uh, to hear them. Yeah, and I've been looking for different questions in the chat room, and we had some earlier but I haven't seen any new ones. People are basically arguing back and forth in the chat room. And we're talking about um, basically testosterone and um, adrenaline and estrogen, so on and so forth. Um, I don't know. I've seen testosterone get in the way as far as there's always an alpha. And then there's those that follow. And they're always trying, in my mind, in what I see in my daily life, trying to work harder and not smarter. And so I always have to come in and say, why don't we do it this way instead of doing it this way? Oh, that makes sense. So you got to kind of make sense because that testosterone is kind of overflowing. And, and this particular person is saying testosterone only is so highly available when you're going through puberty, which I don't believe. I think it carries over into certain dimensions as far as, you know, you always have this alpha male who leads the lower ones. And my husband's like almost 50 now. He's the alpha male. And there's these lowerlings that are constantly following what he's saying and what he's doing. It's not just in pubescence. It's in life, like throughout. It's always there. Um, and they're saying that fear is something that, you know, does certain things. But I think it's not just fear, but it's the testosterone and other things that are causing things to happen. I mean, fear is there, and it can cause different things like feeding negative energy and entities and other things like that. Um, and I'm trying to think of the point I was getting to, but um, yeah, it's just kind of, I don't know. To me, it causes more issues than good, and I'm constantly trying to say, let's work smarter, not harder. We should actually do it this way, not this way. Oh, well, that makes sense. Luckily, they listen when I'm trying to say this because otherwise we'd be here for three weeks instead of one week trying to figure this issue out. I think, I think that a lot of, it comes down to the whole no, notion of the chemi- the chemistry. There's more, the more scientific rational view versus the more um, ethereal, more imaginative, you know, the, the expression in, in, in the society where the, again, it comes back to those expectations. Oh, you've got to work real hard in order to have a good life. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can work smart and have a very good life. And there's no cheat involved because the whole notion of why people work in the first place is to be able to support themselves. This whole this is what I'm talking about with respect to externalization of value that how it expresses largely in modern society. I don't think it's necessarily as true as it once was, but it's it hasn't gone away either. The reality has not set in a lot of people's minds who are who are really controlling the economy still and uh, you know you talk about a you know a personalities type a personalities alpha males um at the end of the day where these are basically hormones you've got estrogen you've got testosterone the information that can be distributed throughout them as as a carrier carrier to various organs various 
systems. It, it's just it's it's a process, and the problem lies in the 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 philosophical connections associations with them. Testosterone oven by itself in a society where there was not the need to go out and you know kill the bear, kill this, kill that, or you know um, prove manhood. This stuff is very much, you know, a product, I think, in a lot of ways of, of, of a far older time or it, it, it doesn't have to be anything but really. I know people want to say constantly, well, it's just human nature. And I know about human nature. I understand, you know, I have a fairly high index for emotional intelligence. I understand why people feel the way that they do, why they react the way that they do. But I don't believe that human nature is immutable by any means. I think a lot of it is conditional. I think it's definitely nature versus nurture in some ways that if you change the nature, if you change the environment, you will definitely see corresponding changes in, in, in the characteristics, how the, uh, the relationship between a, 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 um, a life form with its environment will change as a result of the environment changing. That's the evolution. That's the reconciliation of the new information. Oh, wait a minute. We can do it this way. Wow. Okay. How, well, how does that affect our life overall? Oh, I'm going home and I'm feeling better because I don't feel like I've just put in, you know, a 12 hour day. I've only worked seven hours. So I don't feel like I've worked another five hours. Is that a bad thing? Do I feel like I've cheated? Well, how if I feel so good, can this be a bad thing? And the more that they get the reinforcement, the more that it's societally accepted to feel good as a result of not having to work so hard because you found ways of being able to lighten the load, however you go about it, you know, it just, it makes sense that most people would at some point, once they felt like they'd gotten permission, for lack of a better term, societal permission, unspoken permission, that they would go ahead and enjoy having that level of, of you know, of, of of happiness, of because at at their core, our humanity. A lot of people in this society are masochists. They feel they've got to suffer in order to enjoy something, or they won't appreciate it. And that's not necessarily true. They're conditioned to believe that from a very early age. Um, going back again to the whole battle between Robespierre and and de Tocqueville in 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 France during you know in the years leading up to the French Revolution. You know, you had horrible, horrible atrocities that occurred because people were just out of their minds. There's no other way to put it. A level of absolute social disarray that unfortunately I can see parallels in this country. I have been able to most of the 21st century uh, to the French Revolution. And and, and I, it scares me. It really, really scares me on a lot of levels because there, the emotional disconnect very much occurred in, in France it became strictly about survival, and emotions were a luxury at that point that could not be afforded. Um, we're in a very similar situation right now in this country, particularly, I'd say. And um, I think that a lot of people feel it, although they don't necessarily understand the exact nature of it. Yes, yeah, very scary time, for sure. And I felt uncertain for a long time, and especially poking the rocket man and doing all these other things that... I feel are not politically correct. I'm just like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. We're all going to die. And then recently I've been hearing from different people, psychics that are saying um, Trump is going to be the last president and telling people um, you shouldn't go to the United States for this job because something really bad is going to happen. And I've been feeling this for a very long time. And I don't know if it's just paranoia working through me or if this is actually something that's going to happen. Um, but talking about multi-dimensional or multiverse, um, how do you feel about the Mandela effect? Well, I think that, again, you're, if I'm understanding you right, I've never quite been able to uh, comprehend what that means, but I get the feeling it's analogous. and It, it kind of is it, it, the butterfly effect would be, you know, expanded over the same effect being expressed in different parts of the system. If I'm understanding you right with respect to the Mandela effect, where information affects different things in different ways, is that a good approximation or my way off with that? Well, to some people, 
Some people think it's CERN messing with the God particle and causing these different collisions, which is causing different people to come from different universes, multiverses, into this one. And there's little, small, tiny little changes within people. And sometimes there's big ones like people who had kids before don't have kids anymore. People who didn't have kids have kids now. Uh, um, see. You know, Luke, I am your father changed to something else. Um, life ain't nothing but a box of chocolates turned into something else. The right, Bernstein right. bears turned into this. Um, some people think it's the CERN messing with things and other people think it's just um, basically the different dimensions kind of coagulating, like skipping and skipping and skipping. Some of us stay here and others pass along to other places and they change. And there's only little tiny changes like color of eyes and different things that they like or hair color or different small things like that um or different viewpoints on no it wasn't that it was this as far as like with my husband we used to agree on luke i am your father we'd say that back and forth to each other life ain't nothing but a box of chocolates this and this and that and that and then all of a sudden he's like no it wasn't luke i am your father um Luke, I've always been your father or something like that. I can't remember what it was. Um, but I'm like, okay, uh, other dimensional Vern, you know, because there's millions of us that remember it the same way, but then there's a small fraction of us that remember it differently. Even though it's been the same way this whole time, they remember it differently, perhaps because they're from another dimension. Is this because of CERN or is this because of us being on different dimensions and falling asleep with certain thoughts and then this other person comes through? with other ideals. Like it's so confusing. Again, I, I should qualify. I am not somebody that likes to use the word dimensions because typically there really are only three dimensions. They express differently. You're talking about aspects. You're talking about, again, universes, you know, environments, you know, the, the multiverse basically provides for multiple environments of different characteristics. But what I will say to that is, and this is, I think a fairly easy answer People will focus on different things at a given moment in their lives. And sometimes, depending upon what part they're focusing on, you know, you're watching The Empire Strikes Back and something else is going on. And that is enough to be a distraction, although you're very much aware of the cultural significance. You're going to focus on something different. So you might remember it differently. Not to say that there isn't some bleed through occurring. I think that's possible. Does it end up coming down to being as hard and fast that the exact same things are occurring? I think in a lot of instances, no. I think that the multiverse is not about potentialities per se. I think it's about the environment. You know what I'm saying? In other words, there are going to be differences. If you look at it again from the analogy of the stone and the water, there's going to be changes that occur as conditions decay depending, again, upon how much information is continuing to be provided. So the outcomes may be different, but the reason they're different is not because of potentialities per se. That's certainly an aspect, but there's very specific factors that are playing into why certain things happen in one environment, one multiverse, and then another completely different. I think that's the case, and I think the information sometimes bleeds through for the reasons I've talked about. If we are existing simultaneously, you know, we're different expressions of us that may resemble each other. We may look very different depending upon the environmental conditions. Then you definitely would have that information possibly being perceived differently. But at the same time, there is a fairly down to earth explanation that, you know, we will focus. And there are, there are experiments that have been done with respect to focusing some pretty amazing stuff. I don't know if you've ever read about Cleve Baxter and he was essentially, he ended up being involved with the development of the polygraph. He did experimentation with hypnotism that to this day still is mind blowing, where people could be conditioned, programmed to not recognize something right in front of them, could be looking through people and describe what was behind them. This is so far beyond the realm. It, it, it you know, the non-locality of consciousness becomes very clear in those instances. But it's still a little bit more about being... The, the environment here is still in play more than in, in a, a, a more remote environment, as would be the case with a multiverse. 
but not so remote because there's still that level of entanglement, that that linkage that, you know, as evidenced by the bleed throughs that occur from time to time where people are getting information from other lives, whether they be past lives or, or potentially future lives. And again, I want to stress that this is a, a hypothetical, you know, purely mm-hmm. theoretical at this moment, but it makes a lot of sense, all other things being equal. The evidence is pretty strong that this is, in fact, the case. How it expresses may be a little bit different than what I'm communicating to you and your audience, Tessa, but it, it, it makes sense. Um, with respect to the Mandela effect, when I you know, made the analogy of the butterfly effect, that one domino ends up dropping 200 or 300 if they're placed, if they're, you know, the locations are just right. It's also about the information. You know, that certain types of information will lead to more information and turn to more information. One of the ideas, no pun intended, that I have to be able to change the, the society quickly would be the institution of what's known as a free marketplace of ideas where people would not be discouraged from, from, from voicing, contributing their ideas. If it's a bad idea, people, you know, that the people that would be considering them would remember that from bad ideas can emerge good and from good ideas can emerge great ideas, but if they're never voiced, if someone doesn't feel like they have the opportunity to be able to really speak about what's occurring to them, then they're not going to be likely to speak if something really good comes about. They're, they're not going to be encouraged to value it, you know, what it is that they're thinking of. And I think that's very, very important. And it does end up affecting perception. Perception is very subjective only sometimes because of how much it's encouraged or discouraged by a society. Yeah, and, and I think it's very funny because millions of us remember it a certain way And me and my husband used to be on the same wavelength and we'd be like, Luke, I am your father and other stupid things back and forth. And then all of a sudden he's like, no, it wasn't like that. And I'm like, okay, other dimensional Vern, like he's not the same person he was before. And all these things we agreed upon before he's changed. And, you know, he doesn't take time to go into the internet and different criteria to get this different perspective. He's busy working on um, the rest bucket out in the front yard or fixing his vehicle he's driving and all these other things and all of a sudden he's got this different perspective and i'm like wow like who are you and you know what have you done with my husband (laughs) okay other dimensional Vern, because i think there are these different shifts in the dimension and there's only like you said these little small differences between this person in this realm and this person in the other realm or the other or the other and I think there are these shifts going on. I don't know if it's because of CERN and the collisions with the God particle that they're trying to contain within this metallic tube. Like, how can you really contain these explosions between collapsing or collisions between the God particle and other things? Um, And then there's other people that are saying, if you have this certain thought in your head and when you go to sleep, when you wake up, it's going to be a different world. I don't really necessarily believe that. I think it's something that people are doing that's out of our hands and then you wake up and it's a whole different world, which you don't realize at first. And I didn't even see this until my teenager was like, hey, mom, you got to check this out. And she showed me this, these different videos and more and more videos are coming out and I'm keeping track of this. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, I remember Fruit Loops being like this, but now it's this. Bernstein bears are now Berenstain bears and, um, you know, uh, Shazam and Kazam, like, I don't know. And all these different things that were coming up. Um, the guy that used to, back in the day, hold the, I think it was a ham, ham leg or a turkey leg, now doesn't hold one anymore. And all these different differences. And there's millions of us that believe or remember it the same way. And then there's a small fraction of us that have changed. And there's different little changes within them. So it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around it, especially when it comes to your own family and things you've known for, for me, it's, um, 15 or more years now. And then all of a sudden it's different. Like, where are you coming from with this? And, and who are you? And now I got to check for pods, you know? And so to me, it's kind of confusing. Like how can we agreed on all this stuff for all these years? And now it's different. I feel like he came from another dimension, but I'm still here in this one, which a lot of us are still sustaining in this dimension. And there's a shift for a small fraction of us coming through. And like I said, there's little undistinctive parts of us that are coming through who are, you know, for the people that are coming through that have changed. Um, 
and it's hard to see until you really do see these little small differences and fractions within this realm. I think, I think again, and, and I, I know what you're saying, Tessa, I know that it's very startling. And I don't know whether what he's had to say, if you question or called him out on it. You know, oh, yeah, I see... have. I'm like, OK. Other and, and what does he say? And, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's always been like this and yada, yada, yada. Well, how come you used to say this, but now you're saying this and now you always remember it like this? Like, OK, other dimensional Vern. Like, I think he came from another dimension. He's not the same person he was before, even though he is the same person, but he is from another dimension. And there's slight changes within him. Um, he used to be the most patient person in the world. Now his patience is not that great. Um, different little tiny changes within his personality, um, which happens to people, you know, over every 10 years, people change. And so that's reasonable. But these are hardcore things that, you know, once you have a certain system or certain things that you say and certain punchlines and such and such, and then all of a sudden you're saying these different things, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. And it makes me wonder, like, are are we experiencing people jumping from different dimensions to here, and there's just these small little fractional changes within each person? Um, even, like somebody was saying, the color of the neighbor's car. No, it's always been that color. Or people having kids, but then all of a sudden they don't have kids. Other people never having kids, now they have kids. Like, there's so many different changes that are going on. Um, before I thought it was just like the pop culture, but it's actually affecting families. I, I, all I will say, the best way I can put this, and I think uh, there, was, there was a video that Brian Greene had. If you know who, I'm, I would imagine you know who Brian Greene is. Uh, he basically has some, some ideas with respect to uh, he, string theory in particular, the whole notion of, of, of mul the multiverse. Uh, not necessarily someone that I have had as a reference point for a long time, but I'm beginning to understand the the similarities in our in our views. It's not the there's not a physical correspondence. It's it's information. It could be new information. It could be entanglement with previous information that changes the the, the perspective. It's hard to say. But since you bring up CERN and you brought it up a couple of times, so I'm, I get the impression as it is with me a very grave uh, source of concern. What's being done, perhaps potentially, by virtue of, of the type of work with respect to messing around with different fields, as with something that I believe definitely happened, I think that I can pretty much articulate how it happened, the Philadelphia experiment. Oh, yeah. Tesla and people don't believe in that well, either. No, I know, and the reason why is because it is so far beyond their purview. But again, you're dealing with a situation where the technology now exists. It, the application may not be common knowledge to a lot of people who, who are aware of it, but it's certainly there. With respect to CERN, there is absolutely a risk factor associated with it. I don't know how much it's commonly acknowledged by those who are working there, but the bigger concern for me, and it, this is definitely not well understood by a vast amount of the American public in particular, probably a lot of people around the world, is the HARP project, which started in 1996-97. It was the first step towards geoengineering. And the supposed reason why it even exists was to thicken the ionosphere in order to be able to expand the number of different frequencies for uh, various types of media devices, which makes sense. But at the same time, there are very specific ecosystemic effects that are going to result as a reason you know when you start to mess around because the ionosphere is a huge part of what ends up happening on the planet with respect to weather with respect to seismic activity it's where the resonance is reflected back from the surface where the schumann resonance originates is in the ionosphere so you start changing that media you know you make alterations to the media which has a very strong bearing on what ends up manifesting on the planet, whether it be in terms of climate, in terms of life forms. They're messing around with things they don't understand and threatening the entire ecosystem in the process. But it, is, it sounds so outlandish to them. And I admit it, it sounds, to even when I say it to people, it sounds weird. But when you begin to understand the resonant basis of everything, 
it's like a game of Jenga is the analogy I make. And I talk about something called time crystals. Have you ever heard of those? Yes. Well, for those who aren't aware of time crystals, what they are is very specific resonances allow them to go invisible. They become invisible. And it's analogous to a game of Jenga. If you end up eliminating a specific resonance from a structure, it is going to, depending upon what the resonance is and what the prevailing resonance is that allows for the combined or composite resonance, it will threaten that structure beyond the shadow of a doubt. You've, you, you've taken a, a key element which allows for the coherency out of the mix. Problem being is, is when you start messing around with the ecosystem, the entanglement, the constructive entanglement on a planet-wide basis, you're, there's just so many, so many different things. Why, you know, with respect to the whole notion as far as the 110 hertz value of, of, of the Schumann resonance, Anyone who understands these things, who really can see, you know, can connect the dots, sees the cause and effect, understands something like HARP, 5G is another thing that scares the hell out of me because of the sharing effect, uh, you know, terahertz have on, on DNA. It's been demonstrated. Now, the circumstances or conditions aren't 100% clear, but there seems to be evidence of significant genetic damage as a result of exposure to terahertz frequencies that are associated with um, scanning devices in airports. And now Verizon is going to go ahead and roll out a system which blankets us in these terahertz frequencies. Terrifying. It's, it's, it's so short-sighted, there aren't words for it. And I've talked a lot about it. There are a fair number of people who are aware of that, aware of the dangers with respect to smart meters, just as a little bit of a plug for Purple Plates because it is a device that Tesla envisioned. Mm -hmm. And that Ralph Bergstresser, as a result of knowing Tesla before he died, finally put into production in 1976 for over 40 million. It's been 40 years and millions and millions of them have been sold. The technology is a metamaterial which ends up transmuting these resonant values that are produced like 5G microwaves, ultra short wave, you know, means of powering devices. The plates do work. And at some point, I think, there will be this sort of device, this metamaterial will become, you know, a standard part of any number of devices that are utilizing EMF frequencies that have been recognized as being potentially threatening to human health, to all health, to life. You know what I'm saying? And it really is that cut and dried. These things over time, microwaves, and I'm not saying it's it, as long as you're careful, you can use microwaves. You just have to be aware that when they're in close proximity to you on for a sustained basis, they're going to have very specific effects, not just heating, which is simply about exciting the molecules. And, and that's what heat is. It's basically exciting, creating a higher vibration and friction as a result. Um, yeah, that's those are the things that scare me. CERN, absolutely, but HARP more so in 5G. We're, we're, we're venturing into territory. A lot of the people that are that are putting forth this technology don't even understand it. Yeah, and it's amazing because I'm supposed to have 4G, but I'm lucky if I get 3G, and then they're coming out with 5G, and there's so many different things that people are going to, they're saying that is going to happen. So it's pretty intriguing, and I'm looking forward to seeing what exactly is going to happen. Um, but on that note, we're at the end of our time, so um, Jim, can you tell our listeners how to find you and get a hold of you and contact you with any questions that they may have absolutely again i want to thank you all for hanging in i know three hours is a long slog especially at this hour i hope i you know was interesting anyways um as much as i can i try but uh, i can be reached you can send me uh, a message if you like uh comment uh by all means please do like the page the human internet radio project on facebook uh, I am hoping to have links to these videos that I've spoken of uh, and more soon uh, just for people that have listened to this show uh, as, a, as a token of my appreciation and gratitude. The opportunities that I have to be able to share this information is, is, is very, very gratifying of and by itself. So thank you again, Tessa, for having me on. I want to thank you so much for being my guest tonight, and it was so wonderful having you on the show this evening. Thanks. I hope everybody sleeps well. 
And we're actually doing an after party on Skype. You can hang out if you want, but it's not required. I appreciate the invitation, but I, I think I'm going to probably retire not long from now. Well, thank you so much again for being on the show. And thank you to everyone in Space Out Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, Twitter, Paranormal Radio, TalkStream Live, Deep Talk Radio, and wherever else in the multiverse you're listening tonight. I had a wonderful time this evening, and it was my pleasure, literally and figuratively, and I can't wait to do it again tomorrow night for Psychic Sundays on spacedoutradio.com with Kareem DeWinter. So until next time, nighty night, love and light to all my space cases out there. You guys have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. I'll see you all back here tomorrow night. Don't forget, we are all in this together. Together, we can make the world a little better. And together, my friends, we own the night. If you guys would like to join us for the after party on Skype, the number is 970-335-9596-970-335-9596. And don't be discouraged if you can't get through. I'll call you right back. You guys take care of my use. I'll see you back here tomorrow night for a wonderful evening with the amazing Corrine DeWinter. Again, take care of my use. Nighty night, 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 night. See you back here on the flip side. Oh, the deeper I go, the deeper I fall.